All persons having business for the Honorable Associate Judges, now presiding of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God say this Honorable Court, and this Honorable Court is now in session. Please be seated and come to order. Good morning. Uh, welcome to all. Uh, we are in the District of Columbia Court of Appeals virtual courtroom this morning. Uh, if we have technical difficulties, which sometimes do arise, please bear with us. We will try to fix them as quickly as possible. Um, if I don't say that, the problems will arise. If I say it, I'm hoping I will stave off any issues. Uh, so today we have two cases on our calendar. Um, we have to reconstitute the panel after the first case. So for the folks watching on YouTube, Again, bear with us, there's gonna be a slight pause in the proceedings uh, before we call the second case. But the first case on our calendar today is a consolidated case uh, with four case numbers, 15 CF 1081 and 1083 is the direct appeal, 20 CO 232 and 233 is the appeal from the 23110. Uh, it's DeMonta M. Chappelle versus the United States. I understand that we're going to go forward with the direct appeal first. Uh, so Ms. Persico, you are up. Um, please let us know how much time you would like for rebuttal. Um, and we do, I'm just confirming, we've got the government on the line, uh, although we don't have a visual. Yes, Your Honor, I'm here. Great, thank you very much, counsel. All right, Ms. Persico, when you're ready. Sure. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Deborah, Deborah Persico for DeMonta Chappelle in the direct appeal. Um, I, and I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Um, I'd like to focus on the warrant issues in the supplemental brief and then go to the prejudice prong. Um, as far as the warrants are concerned, there's three reasons that the warrants have violated the Fourth Amendment warrant clause. First is the lack of probable cause. And as to probable cause, it's our position that the warrants in this case are even more egregious than they were in the Burns case. Because unlike in Burns, where the affidavit stated that witnesses had described specific text messages and phone calls to and from the defendant and the decedent, here, with the possible exception of the location of Mr. Chappelle at the time of the murder, not one witness whose interview was described in, in the affidavit said anything even remotely suggesting that they knew of texts or calls or photos or videos or any other digital content that was related to the murder I'm that sorry, counsel, to interrupt. What, sure. what do you mean by the location? What what was in the affidavit that referenced the location that would well, connect the, with the phone? I mean, the, the only thing, and I said it would be a possible exception for probable cause, would be the fact that the witnesses told the defendant that they saw Mr. Chappelle at a certain place on April, I'm sorry, on October 27, 2012, shooting the decedent. Right, but there's nothing nothing about we saw him with his phone. No, at the location. no, and in okay. no, and in fact, there's sort of a ridiculous claim in the uh, in the uh, AT and T affidavit um, that they would need you know phone calls before, during, and after the murder. Now, no one said that they saw the shooter use his phone, text from his phone, either shortly before the murder or shortly after the murder. And after the murder is where they have video surveillance of someone walking down the alley right after the murder. And you don't see that person using his cell phone. But I'm not sure why you only say possible. So uh, imagine, the, so here's the hypothetical. Imagine that the police end up uh, having probable cause to believe that a particular person committed a murder at a particular location. 
mm-hmm. and they decide we want to go get the cell phone of that person. And for a moment, let's say they have a really particular warrant and they say, we want to search the cell phone, we want to seize the cell phone, or we want to search the cell phone and extract from it information that will tell us where the suspect was at the time of the murder. Are no, you saying, I, so my question, again, my question about that is imagine that's the circumstance, but imagine the affidavit doesn't say anything about whether the suspect had his or her cell phone. I mean, imagine there's, the affidavit says there is a cell phone, the person has a cell phone, but it doesn't mm-hmm. have direct information one way or another about whether the person had the cell phone at the time of the murder. Mm-hmm. Well, are you well, saying there's not probable, there would not be probable cause, such a warrant well, would not be supported by probable cause? According to Burns, there would not be probable cause because that same situation occurred in Burns. In Burns, they had information that at certain points during the during the day of the murder or during the evening of the murder, that um, there were texts, there were phone calls, but no one said anything about the location, and the court mentioned that. Um, well, could you tell me what language, in Burns, what language in Burns are you focused on when you say that Burns? holds or establishes that in, in the hypothetical I just gave you, uh, there would not be probable cause. Because I mean, the argument on the other side, I'm not sure, oh, what I, the, but the argument on the other side would be people, the reason they have mobile phones is because they carry them around with them. And so there's enough of a likelihood that someone would have her or his mobile phone with them at a given time, that if you are trying to find out, if you know they have a cell phone and you're trying to prove where they were at a moment, uh, you can go ahead and have probable cause to seize the phone and search at least for locational information. Uh, But you think think Burns holds otherwise? No, I'm sorry. And I I apologize. What I meant to say is that although there was nothing, um, you know, particularized in the warrant about the location, that uh, Burns said that possibly Um, You know, possibly it could have been used like a GPS tracking device from the phone. But that was only because Burns, there was information in Burns that the decedent and the holder of the phone, Mr. Burns, who was not a suspect at the time, had been texting around the time of the murder. Yeah, right? and that's and, right. And the suspect was in Mr. Burns's home. Right. And so, I mean, I, I thought Burns said quote, it's not enough for police to show there's probable cause to arrest the owner or user of the cell phone. Well, right? that's, that's correct. I mean, yes. Everybody, the, no. the whole point of Riley is to say people carry the sum of their private lives mm-hmm. in their phones. Mm-hmm. That does not give the police probable cause to grab their phones and investigate every detail of their lives, their locational history, right. their texts, what have you. The police I, have to come up with more. I mean, I totally agree with you. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I thought you were making a about, concession. No, no, you're talking okay. about, and, I, and I've mentioned this in the briefs, there is no way that the simple fact that Mr. Chappelle was arrested, that they had probable cause to arrest him, that he had a phone on him at the time they were arre- not even on him, it was in the car. He's arrested and, three or three to six months after this crime, right? Ex- yes, exactly. And yeah, so, that's when they find the phone. Right. And that's why I'm saying that there is no probable cause. And if you carved anything out of it, and the rest of the argument will tell you that even this doesn't work, is that they may have wanted to check his location at GPS tracking, which is what Burns said was was a possible reason to look in the phone. But the problem is then you get to the next two categories which are the overbroad um, factor of the warrants. And then on top of that, there's a lack of particularity. Where does Burns say that the G, I thought Burns said that there was probable cause to look at the texts. Where does it say that the GPS is, there was probable cause to look at the GPS information? If you give me a moment, your honor, I will look for it in here. Right. We can we can find it. Here's what it's here's what it says. It's on page 774 
And it says the facts alleged in the affidavits also supplied probable cause to support a search of the GPS tracking features okay. on the phones. Okay, now there was no evidence in Burns that they were texting each other in the, in the same place in the home. The texts were done before uh, uh, supposedly the decedent even arrived at Burns's apartment. And the calls were made long before the decedent supposedly was to arrive at Burns's apartment. But the Burns court said that maybe th that there may have been probable cause uh, to search the GPS tracking features, but when you go to the overbroad section and the lack of particularity, it still doesn't fit. Because in Burns, there was no time limit for it. They were asking for everything for, you know, for a for a period of time that did not fit the night of the murder. And in our case, you have a similar situation, but worse, because in our case, they asked for, um, as to the AT&T warrant, they limited the time period for every, first they asked for everything, everything that's in the phone they want. They limit it for a time period of six days. Now there's nothing, nothing in the affidavit that supports them finding that it was likely for them to find anything that they listed on that warrant during a six day time period, except perhaps the GPS tracking, which Burns said there may have been probable cause for. Then you get to on the facts of that case on the AT and that was on yes, and then here the AT and T warrant. Like I said, there's a limit of six days. Well, there there's no information in that affidavit that supports, uh, you know, finding phone records, uh, calls, texts, videos, whatever, for over a six day time period. Um, so it's overbroad in that respect. Then you get. Go ahead. Can we All talk right. about, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you finish your point, but I, I'd like to talk about um, substantial, uh, you know, prejudice right. in, in the plain error context and, okay. and whether that's satisfied in this instance. And then I'd like to go on to the, the good faith exception. Okay. So if I could just go back a moment and finish with the um, particularity argument. And we also don't forget we have the cell phone contents warrant in this case. And in the trial court, um, as the court knows from our, our briefs, the trial court was not presented with a copy of the affidavit associated with the cell phone warrant, but the cell phone warrant itself asks for everything from time immemorial with no affidavit attached um, and even if you look at the affidavit, which our position is you cannot consider it on appeal, but it's virtually the same affidavit as the AT&T affidavit. Well, it's, it's the, bare bones. Bare bones, exactly. It's, it's bare bones. Bare, bare, right. Bare I'm sorry, there's an, there's an echo when you and I are talking. Can you hear that? Oh, no, I, I don't hear an echo here. It's clear for me. Good. Um, I, okay. But if you don't hear me, tell me and I'll repeat it. Okay. 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 So it is barer bones than the AT&T warrant and certainly barer bones than the Burns warrant and affidavit. Um, so in that respect, neither warrant meets any of the standards for the Fourth Amendment, either probable cause or um, uh, over broadness or lack of particularity. Um, but how does this affect your client's substantial rights? Okay, so for substantial rights, so our position is, first of all, that um, the errors in admitting those warrants and I'm going to say, in addition to the admit, and, and even individually or in combination with the admission of Special Agent Haran's testimony on the drive test, which we argued back in November of 2019, had a substantial influence on the verdict, which depended entirely 
on whether the government's witnesses were believed by the jury that appellant was the shooter. That was the entire case. The entire case depended on whether the jury believed those witnesses. Can you just go back to Agent Moran's testimony? What I was confused about, and I didn't go back before argument to look at his testimony, is, is what the relationship is between his testimony and the information gleaned from the, the AT&T warrant. Is, the, is he testifying on the basis of that information? Yes, yes. Okay. He's testifying based on the cell site location information. Which, from, he, which they would have not, they would not, not have, have gotten had without at the warrant. all. Exactly, without okay. the warrant, exactly. And so back to the evidence. So then the test is how strong was the government's evidence? And I'm going to have to quote you, Judge Easterly, because I listened to that November 2019 oral argument over the weekend. And you yourself said during that argument that the government witnesses were, quote, compromised in pretty significant ways. And we had argued that they were substantially impeached. You add to that the fact that there was no physical evidence linking Mr. Chappelle to the murder. They didn't have a gun linking him. They didn't have DNA. They didn't have fingerprints. They had nothing physically linking him to the murder. And then on top of that, you add the prosecutor's opening, closing, and rebuttal arguments, which are cited in more detail in the briefs. Um, and so all of that evidence, you throw in the evidence from the warrants, which were photos of Mr. Chappelle that the government suggested showed that he was wearing the same clothing that was worn by the shooter on the night of the murder. They introduced from the phone call logs showing that appellant had communicated with um, uh, Robert Brandon and with Larry Wallace, who were government witnesses against Mr. Chappelle. And you have, um, and you have the, the CSLI, the uh, cell site information, and which extended into um, a special agent Haran's drive test test. I mean, yeah, drive test testimony. So when you lump all of that together, you have a case by the government that is not strong. Witnesses who were impeached from here to Sunday, and I think I said this in the last argument, you have no physical evidence and you have the prosecutor hammering the photos, the, the um, uh, cell site information and the contact logs and Special Agent Haran's testimony, you have the prosecutor hammering that in opening, closing and rebuttal. And so okay. for those reasons, we feel that um, Mr. Chappelle's substantial rights were violated. Okay. If, if that is the case, and we move on to the question of suppression, right? Um, can you talk about the good faith exception? And, and here, you know, the timing seems to matter, right? The, these warrants were issued, I, I think, in April and June of 2013. Mm -hmm. yes. And if I have my dates correct, the Supreme Court grants cert in Riley in January of 2014. Mm -hmm. And the decision in that case is issued in June of 2014. Um, so can you talk about how to apply the good faith exception in light of that chronology? Well, as the court said in Burns, the detective should have realized um, that these particular warrants did not comply with the Fourth Amendment. Right, and but in Burns, sorry on, to interrupt, uh, but in, in Burns, the warrants were issued a year after Riley. So yes. the, the timing is different in Burns. Except that all that Riley said, basically, I mean, the basic holding of Riley was that Riley was that a warrant was needed um, to access cell phone contents. And the government had the warrant here. Our position is that the warrant violated the Fourth Amendment warrant clause. Um, it's not that they didn't have a warrant. I know back in the trial court, 
the uh, trial attorneys at first mistakenly thought there was no warrant, there was a warrant here. So th that part of Riley doesn't really change the situation in this case. Why, can, why is that? I, I mean, one way of looking at it would be at the time these warrants were obtained, it wasn't even clear that you needed to have a warrant. And if the police, even if they didn't do a great job of being particular about it or the warrants were problematic in some way, if it wasn't even clear that they needed to get one, one could say, well, then why should you suppress evidence on the basis of the fact that they did what it wasn't clear they had to do, but they didn't do it that well in light of you know, what we now know from Riley and from Burns. Uh, so I'm not sure it's, it's obvious that the uh, fact that Riley hadn't been decided is irrelevant to the good faith inquiry that we have in front of us in this case. Well, first off in Burns, the court says that that was the first case in which this court analyzed uh, the contents of cell phone warrants. And in that case, it found that the good faith exception did not apply. So the same should happen here. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have anything really to do with Riley because the detective got the warrant. We're at a position now where the Burns appellant was in, we're in the same place that Burns was in. With I, I just, I have a hard time with that. I mean, given that we said, we, we made a note of saying in Burns that the warrants issued in that case were, quote, obviously deficient warrants issued more than a year after the Supreme Court's decision in Riley, and then said any reasonably well-trained officer would have uh, known they were invalid, notwithstanding their approval by a judge. And it seems our analysis seems very much tied to the fact that Riley was already the law of the land for a year before the warrants, the, the template warrants in Burns were issued. But I don't see how the holding in Riley changes the situation because the, the holding in Riley was that you now need a warrant to, uh, to access cell phone contents. So that that's that's why I keep saying that Riley doesn't really affect this decision. It this decision is already in the place that Burns was in, that the Burns appellant was in, um, because they had a warrant. So you put Riley aside because Riley said you need a warrant. Okay, fine. Even though that happened afterwards, it didn't change the fact that this detective should have known that these warrants did not satisfy probable cause, particularity, and the overbroad um, uh, requirement. I mean, those requirements still held, and that's what Burns found. That's why Burns said that the good faith exception didn't apply, that the well, but the other, I mean, one difference between this case and Burns, which the decision in Burns emphasized, is assuming, well, that the, uh, the phone searched in Burns belonged to someone who was not a suspect at the time. And the court emphasized that in the good faith part of its discussion saying, uh, you know, at the time, the, the, the detective knew at the time he submitted the warrants that Mr. Burns was not a suspect. That made the existence of any nexus even more unlikely. And so these, and then it's the next sentence really that says, uh, these were obviously deficient warrants. So the, 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 the court in Burns viewed the warrants there as problematic in part, not solely, but in part for a reason. These are not even suspect warrants that doesn't seem to carry over to our case. Do you have a, a reaction to that concern? Yeah, well, I also think that that is irrelevant because as we know, even Burns says this, you do not get prob probable cause to um, seize cell phone contents merely based on probable cause to arrest a suspect. I, and, I get that. And, and, and I don't think it's open to think that that feature of Burns is irrelevant because the court in Burns held it was relevant to the good faith uh, determination that it made. It expressly said, here's another, uh, you know, here's another reason why we're finding no good faith. So, okay. I mean, as a matter of law, that's, that's got to be relevant to us. Now, whether it's dispositive, well, it, not uh, sure, but it seems like it's got to be relevant. 
Well, I think it might be relevant if you had another case where the person um, was not even a suspect yet and the officer tried to get a warrant. I think that's where that portion of Burns would be helpful. But here we have the warrant. And so when you get to the next portion of the good faith exception in Burns, it says that the, the warrant de deficiencies were um, so extreme and apparent that a reasonably well-trained officer with reasonable knowledge of what the law permits would have known the warrants were invalid, notwithstanding their approval by a judge. So all of that is exactly the same. Those, that language fits perfectly within Mr. Chappelle's case. And even though Mr. Chappelle was not a suspect, that should not matter because probable the, the probable cause um, to arrest him didn't make any difference to whether they could execute a search warrant. And in this case, an invalid search warrant or two of them. Counsel, you have- I'm sorry. Counsel, you have spent considerable time on the theory that this entire argument was before the trial judge. I put it to you that the only thing before the trial judge was the return deficiency by the marshals, by the marshals, after they had executed the warrant. Now, it seems to me that all this argument that you've made now calls into question the question of waiver. The government argues rather strongly that it is a waiver, and I don't see how your assumption that waiver is out of the picture aids you at all on the merits of what you've been arguing. In another case, that might be very appropriate, but I question whether it's appropriate here. Um, but Your Honor, a waiver has to be done voluntarily. It's no. not something that's just uh, assumed from the record that you waived something. Counsel and waiver, <laughs> counsel posed the issue the way he wanted it raised. Mm -hmm. And that is, to me, that is waiver. You're not talking about personal waiver by uh, a particular individual who decides to waive his Miranda rights while he's no. being confronted with the police. That's a different kind of waiver. We're talking no. here about a procedural waiver. Mm -hmm. No, but what I'm saying is that they raised a particular issue. The lawyer did not say, we are not raising that other issue, we're only raising this issue. That would be a waiver. But here, they raise an issue a certain way. The warrant and the affidavit for the AT&T um, search warrant and the warrant for the cell phone contents without the affidavit was before the judge. Now, the judge had access to those warrants and the affidavits. The judge saw the warrants and affidavits, and it is not unusual I've seen this many times where a particular issue is raised in a certain way and a very careful judge says, well, I understand that part of it, but this part also bothers me. Now, the judge had access to those warrants and the judge has an obligation to make sure that the defendant's constitutional rights are preserved even if the trial attorney doesn't do that. That's why we're saying this is plain error. Well, we're saying it's plain error on appeal because of uh, the Burns case. But even if you didn't use the Burns case, our position is still that it was plain error. These warrants went before the judge, the judge could see how deficient they were, and the judge should have called this issue to the attention of the prosecutor and the defense attorney and did not. So the error, the error was the trial judge failed to sua sponte raise an issue not presented to him. Well, the first, our first position is that this becomes plain on appeal because Burns was decided on appeal, leaving out what the judge did, what the trial lawyers did. We're just saying that on appeal, this is plain on appeal because Burns was decided while this appeal has been pending. 
Now, if the court does not agree with that position, then our alternative position is that it was plain error for the trial judge not to see that these warrants were deficient when the judge, when, when these warrants were brought to the judge's attention and the judge could sua sponte have looked at them and said to the trial attorneys and the prosecutor, I don't like the way these warrants look. What do you have to say about it? Figuratively speaking, figuratively speaking, your ice is very thin. My what is very thin? The ice, uh, yeah, on which you're stating, is very thin. Mm -hmm. We have a situation in which the trial judge, we'd have to call him stupid if he did not do what you suggest he should have done. No trial judge is that way. Well, that I'm, I understand what your honor is saying. I'm just telling you what our position is on position. the two on the two arguments with respect to plain error. So, counsel, we've heard yes. from you. I th I think we've heard your complete argument on the okay. Burns issue. I mean, mm -hmm. subject to judicial interruption. Sure. Um, but let's hear from the government now. Thank you. May it please the court, Christina Amen, on behalf of the United States. Um, first of all, I would like to begin by discuss or by by mentioning Judge Nebaker's question about waiver, which is that counsel ignores Rule 12 in her analysis of whether there was waiver in this case. The trial judge was not required sua sponte to interpose a motion to suppress evidence, and and counsel is saying here that the evidence. Uh, seized with these warrants should have been suppressed. Um, well, and but counsel just, isn't, I mean, you know, look, there are different ways of characterizing this, but it seems to me what counsel is saying is this was error that was plain. And, and that's sort of the the way that you go about saying it. It's, you know, the, the judge should have noticed it is, it is the effect of saying that something was error that was plain. Um, can well, I wait. shift you to um, the fact that, you know, we had a direct appeal before us in this case where certain issues were argued. And then um, Mr. Chappelle moved to hold the appeal in abeyance and requested the opportunity for supplemental briefing um, in light of Burns, if, if Burns was not, um, if a petition for rehearing on Bonk was not granted in Burns and the government didn't oppose. And it seems to me that that's the point at which the government should have been talking about waiver because that would have saved everybody a lot of time for the government to say, well, this wasn't raised below when it wasn't raised in the initial brief and we don't want supplemental briefing on this. And that's not what the government did. The government apparently, uh, well, I guess just did not oppose holding the appeal in abeyance and ordering supplemental briefing. And so we did that. Um, isn't waiver kind of water under the bridge at this point? I don't think so, Your Honor, because even if the, even if the court does order supplemental briefing, and I would call this court's attention to the Newman case that was just decided, um, even if there's supplemental briefing, it doesn't mean that waiver isn't a relevant issue if we're discussing a suppression issue. Um, and we have counsel. But, we have the argument that waiver is waived. It doesn't make sense to me. No, Your but Honor. What I was don't... the point? I guess, counsel, what was the point of moving for the opportunity to have supplemental briefing if not to invite a response from the government to say no? That ship has sailed. Well, Your Honor, my it's recollection a... is that the, that the government deferred to the court on whether to have supplemental briefing. Uh, and, no, uh... no, the government did not defer to the court. The, uh, the government just did not oppose the motion. And that was the Apologies, opportunity Honor, for the I... government to, to say, don't, don't extend this appeal to encompass another issue. Your Honor, the fact of the matter is that by raising the issue of whether, whether the trial court had a duty to suppress the evidence here, counsel directly invoking Rule 12, which requires that a suppression motion be filed prior to trial. And to the extent that um, 
that, that and counsel even acknowledges that plain error review applies in this case, which means that she's got the burden and, and the burden to show both that there was a that there was error and that that appellant substantial rights were implicated. So yes, I think we... we're definitely best case scenario for appellant. We're applying plain error review. So so maybe we should just go there. Um, and uh, sure, sure, Your Honor. I, ju I just was addressing a Judge Nebaker's question, um, turning, if I might, to the issue of good faith in this case, which directly applies, which directly addresses the issue of whether there was any Fourth Amendment violation or whether there was any obligation to suppress the evidence here. Um, as has been pointed out, at the time that the officers arrested appellant and seized the phone incident to his arrest, Riley was, had not been decided, Carpenter had not been decided. Um, and so we had officers who we would, we would state by definition acted in good faith in both, on both of these warrants by taking the step of putting together a, a search warrants and going to the superior court and asking for permission to access both the at t records and the contents of appellant cell phone. And we would submit that it doesn't make any sense to argue that the good faith exception doesn't apply here because of Burns, which was decided and, and, and where this court discussed what a well-trained officer would know in light of Riley. Here, there was no re requirement from the Supreme Court or this court that the officers even seek a warrant. Um, and they shouldn't be put in a worse position because they sought a warrant here. We would also say that that there were three different warrant affidavits which Detective Partman took to three different Superior Court judges, and there was never a question about probable cause, never direction to modify either of those warrants in light of any issues that those magistrate judges found in reviewing the affidavits. And in light of all of those things, we would submit that Officer Partman acted reasonably acted in an effort to comply with the Fourth Amendment, and that in light of the timing of this case, it would make no sense to apply the exclusionary rule here to deter conduct, which was legal at the time, which, which no decision of the Supreme Court or this court had said wasn't legal. And maybe not legal at the time, but maybe not fairly illegal. Your Honor, we would sub we would submit that it that the court that that's a quibble. Um, it, in other words, there was no requirement that MPD was required to teach these officers even to go get a warrant. But even if there were, um, the officer did that. Uh, in other words, the officer the only thing that would that would suggest bad faith here was that the officer had either. Done, had either lied in his affidavits or just just decided to disregard the Fourth Amendment at all. And here, the, now, the officers- can I ask you, you're focused on a warrant and the point that there may, until Riley came out, it wasn't so clear that a warrant was required. But even before Riley, you would agree, it would, it, it would be clear that you shouldn't go searching through the phone uh, for things unless you have probable cause to do that. So that leaving aside the warrant requirement, there was a probable cause requirement pre-Riley? Your Honor, I don't think that's, a, that's entirely clear in this case because this would have been a search incident to arrest. Um, these officers clearly thought there was because they didn't open up the phone. They didn't do anything with the phone other than save it and go out and find independent information confirming that this actually was Appellant's iPhone. Um, when they interviewed Appellant's girlfriend. Was it a search um, incident to arrest? When was he arrested? He was arrested the same day the phone was served from the car. You mean the same day the phone was seized, or do you mean the same day the phone was searched pursuant to the uh, Apologies, Your Honor. He was he was arrested in a traffic stop. Right. In the car but wasn't that was earlier? Stop. No. When, when was the traffic stop? Um, I believe it was, and, and I'm sorry, I can't find it in the, in the Warren affidavits. I think that it, because it's recounted in both of the Warren affidavits here, um, I believe it was in February of 2014. 
Right, and they didn't seek a warrant until April. That's correct, Your Honor. They didn't. So and, how does that but, make this a search incident to an arrest? They could have searched it incident to arrest without a warrant. It would, there was nothing to say that it would have been illegal to search it. Right, but my question is more about probable cause and search incident to arrest might have implications for how you analyze that, or at least people might have thought that before Riley. Uh, so are you suggesting that you, uh, uh, if uh, before Riley, if the police arrested somebody and then they seized the phone and let's say they had no probable cause to arrest the person or look in the phone. Well, let's say they had probable cause to arrest the person, but had no probable cause to look in the phone. You're saying pre Riley, the good faith exception might have permitted the police without fear of suppression to not get a warrant, but also to search the entirety of the phone, even things that it was obvious they had no probable cause to be looking for. You think all of that was kind of unclear pre Riley, not only the warrant part of it, but also the probable cause, some sort of probable cause about what you are looking at in the phone or where you're looking on the phone if you're speaking. Uh, those are slightly different ways of looking at maybe the same inquiry. I think that the court is overstating what I was just arguing. What I was arguing was that in deciding whether these officers acted in good faith, compliance with the Fourth Amendment, it's relevant to look at what they arguably could have done in February 2014, which is that they seized a cell phone incident to arrest, and there was no case law from the Supreme Court or this court saying that they couldn't have looked on that phone. Now, what they could have done with the phone, um, obviously, they were not in a position standing out on the road to search for everything using Cellbrite in the way that they ended up asking for a warrant to do. Why are we also... looking at what they could have done back in February? Why aren't we looking at what they did in April? And, a, you know, a two month delay between seizing the phone and searching it, isn't that problematic? No, Your Honor, there's nothing at all problematic about um, taking investigative steps before going to the, to, to the measure of asking for a warrant to search the entire cell phone. My only point about talking about what they could have done at the time is that to suggest, as I believe my opponent does, that, that, that they were simply acting in bad faith and in total disregard of the Fourth Amendment and doing what they did ignores the fact that they actually took steps that they weren't required to do at the time to comply with the Fourth Amendment and to ascertain from a neutral magistrate whether their searches were were allowed. Um, that's the only that's the only point in saying that because Riley and Carpenter hadn't been decided here, these officers were taking extra steps than than the bare minimum to make sure that they complied with the Fourth Amendment. In addition to that, uh, we would submit that as the two magistrate judges who reviewed these warrants found, there was probable cause to search both the cell site records, both the AT&T records and appellant's phone recited in both of these. And we would submit that um, Burns doesn't change the fact that, that, that there was probable cause here um, and that the officers acted in good faith in drafting these warrants this way and pursuing a search warrant. What, what the is the probable, I mean, there's the AT&T warrant just recites the facts thus far known to the police about the crime. It's nothing to indicate that the perpetrator had a phone, used a phone, that the decedent had a phone, used a phone. There are no phones anywhere in the facts known to the police. And then after that section, the, the further background is two and a half pages, essentially telling the court, this is how people use cell phones. They use them to make phone calls. They use them to send texts. They use them to get voicemail. They use them to take pictures. And sometimes there's GPS involved that tracks their location. I mean, that is true about, that. that is why people carry phones. But 
I don't think that that establishes probable cause to search this phone. And if it did, I just think Riley and Burns would have been differently decided. I, I don't see how that super general, let me tell you what a cell phone does information provides the government probable cause in this case to search Mr. Chappelle's phone. Permit me to make but, an observation. But, but maybe you could clarify if Judge Nebaker could hold for a second and we could get an answer to my question first. Your Honor, we would submit that both of these warrants set forth a fair probability that evidence relevant to this murder, uh, to the investigation of this murder would be found. <clears throat> based um, on what though? Fair, fair probability based, based on what? Based on the fact, number one, that we had a witness who used who had identified this person through social media, allowing the police to either confirm or dispel the idea that she would had picked out the right person by looking by looking at what Mr. Chappelle's social media showed. What, what does that have that, to do with his phone? He, uh, has a, he has a social media account. What what does that have to do with his phone? Uh, because photographs um, taken by phones are uploaded to social media. And, and again, it has to do with How his did, phone in that his phone is essentially an electronic device used to communicate with social media. And given the fact that we knew that there was evidence on his social media from his social media account that was relevant, there was a fair probability that looking in his phone would find evidence relevant with a nexus to this crime, as in fact- To, it did. to the crime, I mean, that, that's, that's just a huge leap, right? So, I mean, when, is, when does he take this video of, of the fight with the, the witness's daughter? Your Honor, it is not clear from the, uh, as uh, Investigator Mark- Nobody knows. Is... <laughs> okay. So at some unknown point in time, he takes a video of the witness's daughter on the street. And, and yeah. from that, and the, fact, the government the, the wants fact... to say that there's probable cause to think that there is evidence of a murder on his phone? I, I just- Well, Your I, Honor- I don't see the it. Fact that, the fact that he- used his phone to make a video recording on the street suggests that he carried his phone with him and the fact that he was found with it in his car suggests that he carried his He's phone. He's found with it in his car in February when the shooting happened in October. There I mean, it's not, it's not like he was arrested hours after the shooting in the vicinity with his phone. I don't, I don't know Your that, Honor, that would persuade would me, but, fact, it, but it's not even that, it's not even that clear. We would submit, Your Honor, that the fact that he was known to actually video, he had videotaped a fight on the street in that area, and that he was arrested with his phone, gave the officers a, a fair probability, which is all that was required, a fair probability that that phone would contain evidence uh, suggesting what his locations were, whether he'd made any tape, any, any videos that night, anything along those lines. It, it's a fair probability that evidence with a nexus to, um, to this crime would be found. And we would submit that even if this court is to now scrutinize this and decide that isn't a fair probability, that what Detective Portman did was reasonably say, all right, I'm going to put down what I have. I'm going to go to a magistrate judge and I'm going to ask, can I have permission to access the phone to see whether there is anything? Um, and so given that there is at least a fair probability that the evidence that he sought to search on the phone and that the evidence that he asked AT&T for would, would have a nexus to this crime, a fair probability only, and that if there's any doubt he asked a, mag a neutral magistrate judge, two different ones, to resolve the question of whether he had enough, means that A, there was probable cause, and B, he was acting in good faith. And we would submit that appellant has failed to show any plain or obvious error in the conclusion that number one, there was probable cause, and number two, there was that the officer here was acting in good faith. This was not a bare bones warrant. This was a warrant to search a cell phone found in a suspect's possession at the time of his arrest. And there was 
probable cause, a fair probability that relevant evidence would be found on the phone. And Counsel, I, I, think, might... I, I think we have your argument. Did, I'm sorry, did you have one other point did... that you wanted to make? Uh, well, first of all, I think Judge Nebuchadnezzar had wanted to ask a question, number one, and, uh, and if that's not the case, there was one more point. Well, what I was going to ask you about is this. Why has this argument relapsed back into the question of the merits of the Fourth Amendment issue? It seems to me, and it reminds me very much of a quotation some years back by the Court of Military Appeals. If this issue had been raised, it would be a totally different matter. But if is the epitaph upon the gravestone of opportunity. And this issue has not been raised. And I suggest that we ought to stop right there and say it's waived. Thank you. Uh, if, I, if I might, Your Honor, I agree with that. Um, and I also would, would argue that um, the fact is that in this case, appellant just hasn't demonstrated as he must under plain error review that his substantial rights were affected by the introduction of the photographs and videotape. Um, neither of these were uh, substantive um, evidence of his guilt. They merely served to corroborate the testimony of government witnesses and the other video that showed him in similar clothing and that Doris Bronson explained her connection to him both via Instagram and via no, see, having seen him make the videotape that was at issue. And furthermore, um, actually, I forgot what I was going to say. So, uh, oh, and I, and I would say in addition to that, Burns simply doesn't require the conclusion his, that appellant substantial here. In Burns, this court characterized the evidence found uh, with a de using a defective warrant as the centerpiece of the government's case. And that is hardly the case here. Uh, well, there, counsel, there, no can, I just, here. can I just jump in and just ask when you were talking about affecting substantial rights, you mentioned the photo of the defendant and the video of the um, witness's daughter in a fight that uh, Mr. Chappelle apparently took. But you didn't mention the um, data from the cell phone company that I thought Ms. Persico said Agent Horan based his testimony on. Um, can you speak to that? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Again, the data from, that, so from the cell phone records simply was not, again, the centerpiece of the government's case or anything close. The government didn't, didn't I mean, I, can I just push back there and say, you know, you have a bunch of eyewitnesses who are impeached to greater or lesser degree, but you have kind of unimpeachable cell phone data placing Mr. Chappelle in, you know, incriminating locations. And why do you think that that is not a centerpiece of the government's case? Uh, because, Your Honor, if, if we look at this in, in Kodiakus and just um, imagine for a moment this case without the cell site data, we still would have had two eyewitnesses implicating appellant. Uh, we still would have had appellant's efforts to obstruct justice, which are completely unimpeachable and had nothing to do with these warrants in the least. And we, we still would have had a government's case um, with, with witnesses uh, it's not a sufficiency not. question. For sure, the government had sufficient evidence. It's just whether or not the introduction of this evidence that potentially was illegally obtained made a real difference in the jury's assessment of his guilt. And it's hard It's and, hard where the government, I, I mean, didn't the government rely on the, the cell phone evidence quite a bit in closing? No, Your Honor, not quite a bit. Um, Council made one uninformed or one ill-advised statement that the cell phone data placed defendant in the block, which actually was not technically true with what we can see from these cell site records, which is that if, if the court reviews the, the pie wedge maps that, were, that we discussed at length back in 2019, there's more than a block contained in the sector 
from which appellant made calls immediately prior to the murder. And, and so to the extent that, that that particular line wouldn't have been present in the, in the government's closing argument, we still have witnesses who say appellant was in the block. They place him there. And, to, and the cell site records did no more than corroborate the fact that he was present in that area. Um, and, and we would submit, given the fact that even the alibi defense that he posed in his obstruction letter and his uh, other ob attempted obstruction and of justice, suggesting that somebody testified that they'd seen him in the area, and the fact that he also introduced evidence um, from his GPS monitor showing that he frequented that area in the time after the murder really leaves the cell site records not being anything close to the kind of centerpiece that, that was discussed in Burns, and an appellant has not shown that his substantial rights were violated by, allow, by use of the evidence seized pursuant to either the AT&T warrant or the warrant to search his phone. All right. And if, there, if there are no further questions, we would ask that the direct appeal, uh, that, that this court affirm the judgment in the direct appeal. Thank you, counsel. Um, Ms. Persico, we'll give you just a couple of minutes in rebuttal. Okay. Um, thank you, Your Honor. So um, I'd like to start first with what the prosecutor said during the closing argument. Um, the prosecutor did rely heavily on what they seized from the phone and the records, the uh, cell site location records. The prosecutor talks about, in closing, talks about, reminds the juror that there was a photo of appellant in the cell phone that showed him wearing the same clothing that witnesses said he was wearing during the, um, during the murder and also the same clothing he supposedly was wearing at the Crown gas station video surveillance that was taken shortly before the murder. Um, the prosecutor reminded them that uh, although Larry Wallace had denied that he was close with Appellant, Appellant's cell phone contents show a photo of Appellant and Wallace together. Um, and then to, to say that Agent Horan's testimony didn't mean anything is, is really completely, um, I can't even think of the word, but that testimony surely had an effect on the jury. You have a government case with a slew of witnesses who have prior convictions, who've been impeached with inconsistencies and um, uh, testimony where they had lied to investigators, lied to prosecutors. And then you put on the special agent who has uh, the aura of reliability that this court talks about in other cases with respect to being an expert. Here's the expert and the expert's gonna come in and tell you that Mr. Chappelle was in that block at the time of the murder. And that's what the prosecutor ends up telling the jurors in her rebuttal argument that he was in that block. So it is nonsense really to say that the, um, that, that the cell phone records, the cell phone contents were meaningless with respect to the entire case. All of that evidence substantially influenced the verdict uh, in this particular case. Um, as far as um, there was one comment that Judge McLeese made that really uh, I think is the key here for the good faith question. And that is um, you asked even before Riley, wasn't it clear that you needed probable cause? And, and that is true. You still needed probable cause to search, to get a search warrant for anything, no matter what it was. And these particular warrants did not establish that the government would find anything that they, they got from the cell phone or um, uh, the cell phone records. That affidavit only told the judge that witness number one, two, three, four, five, six saw the murder and this is what happened at the moment of the murder, that's it. Um, so our position still is that this is plain error on appeal, 
that the good faith exception doesn't apply, that both of these warrants violated the Fourth Amendment warrant clause, and we ask the court to reverse Mr. Chappelle's convictions. Any questions? Struggling to <laughs> unmute myself, sorry. Um, thank you, counsel, for your argument. Thanks to the government. Thanks to Ms. Persico. Um, we're going to move on to the 23110 appeal. So, Ms. Persico, you can drop off now. Oh, um, I can I can leave the leave the Zoom meeting now. You Your can Honor? leave you can okay. leave the argument. And okay. um, Ms. Cresta Savage, you okay. are thank you. up. Thank you. thank you, Your Honor, and good morning, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court, my name is Patricia Cresta Savage. I represent DeMonta Chappelle for purposes of his post conviction uh, motions. Uh, I will reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Chappelle, we ask the appeals court to reverse the judgment of the Superior Court, which found that trial counsel provided effective assistance to Mr. Chappelle, even though. He failed to effectively investigate, follow through, and present both alibi and Winfield defenses. Mr. Chappelle has always and continues since his arrest argued that he did not uh, kill this victim and never wavered from that, even with trial counsel. Uh, as a reminder, when the shooting took place, it was at a park across the street from, and thus was in a field of view of a gathering of people that numbered by some estimates in the hundreds. Uh, any number of whom may have had, had potentially been a witness. And also when the shooting took place and as trial counsel was aware, DeMonta maintains that he was at a party at his aunt's house a few blocks away, also attended by dozens of people, many of whom could have been potential witnesses. At the 23-110 hearing, post-conviction counsel called some witnesses who testified that the real perpetrator of the crime had been Mr. Chappelle's father, Dewey Chappelle Sr., uh, a so and, and a so-called Winfield defense, and that DeMonta was at the party when the shooting occurred. Uh, DeMonta continually asked trial counsel to pursue the alibi defense. However, trial counsel testified uh, for, for the government at the 23-110 hearing that he had presented defenses of misidentification and fabrication. On direct e examination, uh, trial counsel recalled looking into some potential Winfield, but then he further testified that he never got far enough that it was anything we could present. Based on the fact that none of the 23-110 witnesses reasonably explained why they did not come forward with the identity of the shooter earlier and the discrepancies among the testimony of various witnesses and based on the credible nature of Mr. Roberts' testimony, the court found that Dewey Chappelle Jr.'s identification of his father uh, was simply incredible. And with regard to an alibi, the defense team spoke with a couple of potential alibi witnesses. And in fact, in trial, we considered the possibility, as quoted from Mr. Roberts' testimony, we considered the possibility of putting two witnesses on that were alibi, but ultimately decided not to do it. He testified that as a general rule, we're reluctant to put on alibi witnesses because by doing so, you take on the burden and he and his colleagues were in agreement that if the jury does not believe the alibi defense, then you're going to lose the trial. The court found that there was in its mind a looming issue that made it all but impossible to call any alibi witness, uh, the defendant's efforts to obstruct justice. The court also suggested the possibility that the obstruction letters would really discount any alibi witness. Trial counsel said, we were concerned about that and and what it would do if that was happening. Ultimately, the defense put on no alibi witnesses, nor counted, uh, nor attempted to counter any of the obstruction letters in any significant way, despite uh, the fact that the uh, defendant had, the, the appellant had in his letters uh, actually mentioned that he was going to mount an alibi defense. Uh, trial counsel never discussed with him the fact that he was not going to mount that defense. And uh, so it was a surprise to Mr. Chappelle. Um, regarding, counsel, yes. I mean, we're, we're familiar with the arguments in your brief, but I, I mean, 
why do you think that the trial court got it wrong? The trial court saw the witnesses who were presented at the hearing and didn't credit them. So, um, you know, counsel may um, have ill-advisedly failed to contemplate putting them on or, um, you know, had failed to investigate. But at the end of the day, if the trial court heard from these putative witnesses and didn't credit them, where does that leave us? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first of all, what is particularly uh, disturbing is the fact that the trial court found all of defense witnesses at the 23-110 hearing incredible and yet credited all of the uh, government's witnesses. Uh, is that forbidden? No, that is not forbidden, Your Honor, but uh, I would argue under McCraney versus United States that the judge's firsthand assessment of witnesses' credibility um, is unassailable. However, uh, there's, a, there's a footnote in McCraney which reads, any factual finding anchored in credibility assessments derived from personal observations of the witnesses is beyond appellate reversal unless those factual findings are clearly erroneous. And here we, uh, we would argue that the, the government witnesses, just like defense witnesses, delayed uh, in coming forward. Uh, as was mentioned in the past argument, uh, Miss Doris Bronson, she was the witness whose daughter was videotaped. She didn't come forward until after the videotaping of the daughter and her daughter was arrested. In addition, uh, Floyd Carter, he didn't come forward until two years after uh, the, uh, the original investigation of the police officers. And that was because he was arrested in Prince George's County. Uh, and because of that, then he received, a, obtained a benefit from his testimony. I, I guess I'm not following, right? I mean, the, the defense witness or the, the witnesses for the prosecution were put on the stand at trial and all of this was aired. And nonetheless, the jury seemed to credit their testimony. At the 23110 hearing, Mr. Chappelle had the burden and he put on witnesses and the trial judge did not credit their testimony. And so I'm, I'm not quite sure that I understand what, what the comparison is or what the what the problem is with the trial court's ruling. I mean, this isn't a case where we can say that the trial court was clearly wrong to uh, decide that these witnesses were not credible at this juncture, or I'm, I'm not hearing why the court clearly got, got it wrong in making that credibility assessment. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, well, in let's use, for example, the case of Mr. Dewey Chappelle. Uh, what I am saying is Mr. Dewey Chappelle at the time of the trial didn't come forward, but not only that, Mr. Roberts failed to interview him. Um, and, right. and, and I'm saying, you know, except for the sake of argument that that was deficient performance, that Mr. Roberts should have talked to uh, Mr. Dewey Chappelle. Um, but then Mr. Chappelle but your client put Mr. Dewey Chappelle on the stand at the hearing and his testimony was not credited by the trial court. Where does that leave us? That, that's what I'm wrestling with. Well, first of all, the, the, the trial court really did not give any particular reason uh, in most cases as to why she didn't credit, but she was did. The trial, was the trial judge asked to do so? I believe that the... Uh, Oh, it was brought up during this appeal. Uh, no, I'm Honor, talking about. But I don't. I'm I talking don't believe, about was the trial judge, the hearing judge, asked to do so. Uh, I don't believe that the trial judge. Uh, well, I believe a motion for reconsideration was filed, and at that point, may ha it may have been asked that she provide. Uh, uh, her credibility findings, but I don't believe that the record, the record is deplete with any uh, 
uh, real reasons for her credibility findings. And I point the court to the, the case of United States versus Little, where the trial judge's legal conclusions are reviewed de novo. In particular, we know we owe no deference to the trial court's legal con conclusions here. But I, I believe that it's more than curious that she finds all of the uh, defense witnesses incredible and also goes on to say and this is a reputable lawyer and so i know that if there had uh if these witnesses should have been reviewed then he would have done so uh, yeah, in I, addition I, I on the credibility point counsel i, I the one difficulty that you haven't really zeroed in on yet is when the trial court does explain in, in ruling on the ineffectiveness claim the sort of assessment of the evidence. One point the trial court makes is that the, the government's witnesses, although they may have been impeached, they were corroborated in various ways by various pieces of evidence that may bear on the, the, the you know, the substantial prejudice arguments that we were hearing in the earlier argument. But uh, the trial court points that out. And then the trial court seemed correlatively to be concerned about the defense witnesses that you know, far from being corroborated by external extrinsic information, they kind of had the problem that they played into the obstruction letters uh, or uh, writings. Uh, and so the trial court was drawing distinctions among them uh, for additional reasons that you haven't really zeroed in on yet. Yes, Your Honor. I think, uh, as as described in the last argument, however, all of uh, most of the government witnesses were impeached. And many of the government, unlike what the trial court found, that there were some alleged uh, eyewitness identifications that were made, I would argue that uh, on, in the case of, uh, of Floyd Carter, I believe, um, well, yes, Floyd Carter, he, again, he was the one that came uh, forward two years after uh, the actual incident. And in the case of um, Doris Bronson, uh, she was impeached as well, and uh, I would argue, that in getting to the second point of your question, um, I, there was some supporting evidence. Well, it's hard to consider the credibility without considering the 23110 motion and what was failed, to, to, what the defense counsel failed to investigate. I think it's hard to distinguish those two things. If the defense investigator, for example, there was one witness that came forward, Ms. Teresa Glasgow, she was the first witness on the scene and she, she was considered a Brady witness. She, uh, she observed an individual get into the vehicle that was uh, observed in the alleyway or shortly after the murder. Um, in addition, uh, a Mr. Wallace, uh, who allegedly uh, was supposedly to take a gun from a Mr. Brandon, uh, later recanted his testimony and said he, he lied, there was no gun. Uh, but it, it is clear and through his own admission that uh, defense counsel uh, failed to, he, he admitted at the 23110 hearing he goes, uh, he, he t I'm sorry, not goes, he testifies that Marcus Burton was a potential alibi witness who was eliminated because he was dating the defendant's sister. But at the hearing, Mr. Roberts admitted that in retrospect, I probably should have uh, reached out to Mr. Burton as a witness, but I did not do it. Uh, the government also noted this additional statement by Roberts. I think in retrospect, I should have talked to Mr. Burton to at least assess better what he would have had to say about the alibi. Uh, so I think that the, that the fact that the uh, defense counsel's uh, performance was deficient under the Cosio case uh, should be coupled with the credibility findings. And this court should have allowed um, uh, further investigation into some of these uh, allegations. Uh, Mr. Roberts in the end basically said, uh, Mr. Chappelle lost his trial. So by very definition, maybe my representation wasn't adequate. He basically uh, asserted a misidentification, which in my opinion, uh, or, or which in should uh, pause this court in considering whether why he didn't uh, investigate the Winfield defense. 
it just stands to reason if Mr. Chappelle wasn't the person who committed this crime, then who was? And uh, Mr. Roberts admitted that during his hiatus when he went, uh, because he was uh, on sabbatical, uh, for about six months, that he failed to uh, investigate some of these issues. So by definition, uh, and even Judge Anderson uh, during the 23110 uh, had some question uh, about that. Uh, so I believe that uh, had there been further investigation, the credibility of these witnesses could have been ascertained. If that responds to your, to your question, Your Honor. Um, I would point out in, in the Cosio case uh, that uh, regarding the ineffective assistance, that uh, it stands to reason that any reasonable competent attorney uh, would have realized that pursuing these leads was necessary to make an informed choice among possible defenses. And in not doing so, uh, the uh, defense counsel failed in his duty to um, uh, provide an adequate defense, a fair trial under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, as cited in the Wiggins case. Uh, as a result, courts uh, subsequent deference to counsel's strategic decision, which happened in this case, and I'm reading from a footnote in Cosio, um, did, did not present every conceivable mitigation uh, defense, despite the fact that counsel based this allegation choice on what we have made clear was an unreasonable investigation. So I think it's the, co the combination of the unreasonable investigation, along with the just carte blanche credibility findings of the trial judge that have caused an issue uh, in this case. Uh, I would also like to point out um, that even Judge Winfield, who was the trial judge in this case uh, on the obstruction charges had asked uh, counsel to brief that issue. And uh, uh, so she also uh, took note that counsel um, failed to uh, fully investigate the obstruction charges and never really put on a defense regarding those, despite the fact we believe that that was the uh, deciding factor for the jury when they heard uh, from from uncontradicted witnesses along with uh, the obstruct, the, these alleged letters, wherein if you read the content of the letters in, uh, that were cited in the government's brief, uh, it was clear that Mr. Chappelle could have been merely directing, you know, he has a right to participate in his defense. He could have been merely uh, directing his witnesses what to say. He was adamant about the alibi defense, and that was clear in the letters that he sent from the jail. In addition, regarding some of the other deficiencies of defense counsel, he failed to show him, uh, Mr. Chappelle the video prior to trial of this alleged car owned by Dewey Ch Ch Chappelle Sr. Uh, he failed to show him the video of uh, that was taken from the children's hospital. Um, and uh, counsel, you, yes. you are at the end of your time. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. We, we do have your brief where you detail the, the deficiencies uh, of counsel in your view. Um, so do, do you have anything you'd like to close up with? Yes, um, I, I would just add or in closing, Your Honor, thank you with hundreds of potential witnesses across the street from the shooting. And, and by the way, I just want to point out again, the shooting took place very close to the aunt's house and very close to the gas station. Uh, it, it, it seems though uh, undersigned defense counsel gathered little or nothing that either solidified the government's case or thoroughly eliminated the reasonable prob probability that someone else committed the, the murder. Uh, in summary, we ask the appeals court to reverse the judgment of the Superior Court, which found that trial counsel provided effective assistance to Mr. Chappelle because he failed to effectively uh, investigate, follow through, and prevent pre present effective alibi and Winfield defenses. In addition, we would ask the court to uh, find clear error in the judge's credibility findings given the carte blanche approval of all government witnesses and uh, disapproval of defense witnesses. Thank you, Your Honor.
Thank you, Council. We'll give you a little bit of time in rebuttal, uh, but now we'll hear from the government. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Once again, Christina Ament back on behalf of the United States. Uh, we would submit that the trial court did not err in denying appellant's 23-110 motion, both because counsel or because appellant fails to show deficient performance on behalf of counsel and fails to show Strickland prejudice resulting from any deficiency in the performance. And first of all, if I might take the alibi uh, issue first, we would submit that there was no um, unreasonableness in counsel's tactical choice not to present an alibi defense. There were two chief problems with an alibi defense in this case. Number one, um, which the trial court pointed out in denying appellant's 23-110 motion, um, number one was the, quote, looming issue, unquote, of the obstruction letters, one of which lays out the alibi defense that appellant now wants to say counsel should have put forth and was deficient for failing to do so. So at the time that counsel made the choice not to present an alibi defense, um, at, the, at the time counsel made that choice, the indictments were in for obstruction and it was going to be a possibility that the jury would simply conflate any, test, any alibi testimony that was given with appellant's directives um, to witnesses or to, to one of these witnesses, his endeavor to get that witness to come up with the same alibi. The second problem with the alibi defense in this case is that, um, and particularly with the one proffered here, is that appellant's witnesses wanted to suggest in the 20 through 110 that appellant was at this Halloween party from at least five minutes to nine until one of the witnesses, I believe, talked about midnight being the latest hour. And if we look at the cell site records, we will see that appellant actually, appellant's phone actually moved between 9.08 and 9.17 to an area where this party was not included and where his home was included. So he was going to have to overcome the idea that there was a map showing that he was in, he was, was in the vicinity of this Halloween party, which is the same cell sector as the murder um, for a time but that he made a move to arguably leave the party, um, which his witnesses would not have supported. And so for those reasons, we would submit that counsel made a tactical choice. Even though he had alibi witnesses on standby and had considered presenting this, he made a reasonable tactical decision not to present an alibi defense here because he would have run up against cell site data and he would have run up against appellant's own efforts to obstruct justice. Um, turning to um, the issue of a Winfield witness, we would submit that even appellant's own witnesses at the 23110 acknowledged that they never told counsel anything about um, Mr. Dewey Chappelle Sr. being the killer. Uh, and, and through all his investigation, defense counsel never found any evidence to support that. In order to present a Winfield defense, he would have had to put forth some evidence supporting that Winfield defense. He couldn't just bring this up with nothing to support it. And we would submit that the problem is that the two most salient features that were described by the government's witnesses um, were that the person was very short, i.e. five foot three or so, um, and bald, simply did not match Mr. Dewey Chappelle Sr., who, um, or, or I'm sorry, very short and long dreadlocks, did not match someone who was five, seven or five, eight and bald. Um, and so there was no unreasonableness in counsel's not being able to grind the, uh, these witnesses into coming up with this when they, by their own admission, didn't tell him about it at the time of trial. And the reasons for not telling him about it at the time of trial were dubious. So we would submit that in both these particular issues, Council has, or the 23-110 motion did not actually show deficient performance. And the trial court's credibility findings about the witnesses who came forward to say, well, we would have said X and Y at trial. This is what we, this is what we would have testified to. The trial court was entitled to observe those witnesses and determine whether they were credible or not. She discredited them to the extent that 
there is just simply no showing by appellant of any Strickland prejudice that would have resulted from counsel's decision not to call these particular witnesses or put on these particular strategies at trial. And if there are no further questions, we would ask that the trial court's decision on the 23-110 motion be affirmed. I mean, what's, what's interesting is that maybe counsel should have moved to suppress uh, the cell, cell phone evidence, uh, but that hasn't been argued to us today. Um, well, so, Your Honor, Your Honor uh, we, would, we would submit that because there was no grounds on which to suppress it, that he couldn't have shown. No, I, I understand that that's the government's position, but um, just the fact that you mentioned the, the cell site records as refuting the alibi um, that seems to be additional fodder for thinking that counsel perhaps uh, should have should have spoken up about the, the warrants uh, being invalid. Um, all right. Well, uh, unless my colleagues have any questions, um, we will hear briefly from Ms. Cresta Savage. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Um, just regarding the ineffective assistance, again, I, I point the court to co the Cosio decision wherein they quote Wiggins, because in this case, uh, I would argue that it's ineffective assistance of counsel uh, because there is a reasonable probability that a competent attorney aware of favorable evidence would have introduced it at trial in an admissible form. He admitted at the 23, he being defense counsel admitted at the 23110 hearing that he failed to show him the video, that he failed to uh, discuss with him not calling uh, the alibi witnesses, and that he made a decision regarding alibi despite the fact he didn't talk to all of the witnesses that were provided to him. Again, I repeat, he was on sabbatical for six months, leaving it to his investigators and a, an unseasoned attorney at the time um, to continue on. And this is a, this is a very um, uh, extreme case. It's a murder case and it's something that uh, full investigation would be necessary on. And regarding the alibi defense, again, uh, even the self site data shows that it was every position where uh, this phone was located was in close proximity uh, to the, uh, the party at the aunt's house, et cetera. So uh, despite the fact that he was found, uh, that the cell phone was found at a different location doesn't mean he wasn't at the party and doesn't mean that he couldn't have put on uh, specific alibi evidence to address the issue. Uh, and again, um, I, I would just ask the courts to reconsider or to reverse the decision of the trial court uh, because uh, under the Cosio case, uh, this investigation was not reasonable under the circumstances and Mr. Uh, uh, Chappelle deserves a fair, fair trial under the Sixth Amendment. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Presta Savage. Uh, thank you for, from government counsel. Um, Thanks to everyone who participated in the case today. Uh, the, the case now, the full consolidated case will be um, submitted. Uh, I trust that you'll pass that on to Ms. Persico uh, really since are. she, with our permission, left, left the argument uh, before, uh, before we were totally done. Um, but thanks to everyone and the court will stand adjourned. Thank you. This honorable court is now back in session. Please come to order. My apologies to the parties. We had some technical difficulties, which I thought we wouldn't have because I mentioned the possibility of having them when we started, but uh, that didn't protect us. So here we are. Um, we have one other case on our calendar today, United States versus Delonta Hawkins. 18 CO 1330. Uh, Council, when you are ready, please proceed. Can you hear me, Council? Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. <laughs> 
I think I'm okay now, right? Yes. <laughs> May it please the court again. <laughs> Sharon Sprague representing the appellant, the United States in this case. I'd like to save three minutes for rebuttal if I may. The trial court's conclusion that Appellee should register as a sex offender for only 10 years as if he were a first offender is so clearly and indisputably wrong that correction by this court is warranted no matter what procedural mechanism the court employs to review the case. And I will certainly address the jurisdictional issues, but because the trial court so misinterpreted the statute, I'd like to start with that. As we know, DC's Sex Offender Registration Act was passed, quote, to protect the public, especially minors from the threat of recidivism posed by sex offenders who've been released into the community. In other words, the intent of SORA is very clearly to prevent recidivism, not to reward or ignore it. It is clear and undisputable. Oh, and, and I'm sorry to, you know, that I think the intent is clear, um, but I think it would just be most helpful for the, the government um, and then counsel for Mr. Hawkins just to walk us through the statute um, because there is a, a thicket of verb tenses and, um, and so it just would be helpful. Where, where do you start your analysis? That, that's, that's very true, Your Honor. If you re and reading the courts, uh, I mean, the transcripts, uh, it seemed everyone was, was uh, uh, flummoxed by those, that thicket. Um, but here we have, and in I think the court, well, I, and let me, if I could just finish the thought that, that the, the, we can't forget, I will get exactly to the statutory construction, but we cannot forget the, the purpose of the statute. And I don't think anyone here will, um, but we Ms. think Sprague, that it's read as a whole, yes? Ms. Sprague, let me ask you about that purpose, recidivism. There are recidivists and then there are recidivists. And you're familiar with what we call the three strikes laws. I am. What, what makes it so apparent that this lifetime registration provision was meant to apply to a second offender as opposed to a third offender? The words two or more. It couldn't be plainer in my, in my view, Your Honor. I think the statute- actually, actually, it could be. The Jacob Wetterling Act provides a template for local legislation like this. And the Wetterling Act talks about one or more. Why, why did our council depart from that language? Well, the, our, our council, um, indicate, concluded that upon a first offense, um, an offender needed to register, and that that would be for ten years. Upon a second, if if there were two or more offenses, the then the lifetime registration component kicks in. Um, the well, the again, to be precise, and I do think it'll help to zero in on the word of the, the statutes. If you're referring to twenty two four thousand and three, it's not upon the offense. It's upon a finding that the defendant committed a registration offense, which is a defined term, right? Correct. And committed and, a registration offense is defined as was convicted or found not guilty by reason of insanity. And that's where, or, people, and that's where people start getting unclear because conviction is sometimes means the adjudication of guilt, whether by a verdict or a guilty plea, and other times mean other times is used to mean the judgment of conviction created at the time of sentence, imposition of sentence. Uh, and so that's why people do find some uncertainty for that reason. And then the other reason the judge Easterly identified, which is you have to wend your way through three or four different provisions to figure out how to fit the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, can I just ask you one basic question? So if, yes. we're, if we're focusing on the duty of the superior courts, this is 22, 4003, the language that you were paraphrasing says, mm -hmm. and talking now about first, uh, 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 let's say a simpler case than ours, a first, someone who's been adjudicated guilty of a uh, registration offense for the first time. So now the question is, what do we do about SORA registration? And the statute says, upon a finding that a defendant committed a registration offense, then the judge has to enter a, a, you know, an order. Um, do you think that finding that a defendant committed a registration offense occurs at the time of the adjudication of guilt, the jury's verdict or the plea? Or do you think that finding that the defendant committed a registration offense can only occur 
at the time of to decide whether exactly at the same moment of or a little bit later, but at the time of sentencing. I think this. I think the the uh, statute itself, when read as a whole, and the legislative history that supports that statute, would indicate the former that it, it becomes effective at the time of uh, the 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 determination that the crime was committed, and in this case, that's by guilty plea. It and could be by happens, uh, There seems to be some dispute about whether that's what's actually happening in Superior Court. Do you know right. whether? In fact, the United States' position is it has been in the Superior Court, Judge, you need to be uh, imposing these sex offender registration orders at the time of adjudication of guilt, whether that's by verdict or plea, and have Superior Court uh, judges been doing that, or what's actually happening in the real world on that topic, because that seems to be disputed. Exactly. I, I think... I think well, the reason I make that argument is based um, is because of the language of the statute and the legislative history. But as a practical matter, no, I don't think um, it, it, the, the registration is, as I understand it, not routinely. We don't request it, and it's not routinely imposed at the moment of a of a plea of guilty. It is done at the time of sentencing, and why would that be as a practical matter? Because a defendant could withdraw their move to withdraw their plea. Um, or otherwise, uh, you know, not actually be required to register. Well, I, I'm puzzled. I, I mean, I can see uh, practical reasons why one might want to delay or maybe have written a statute differently. But if your position about how to interpret the statute is right, it doesn't seem like there's lawful authority for superior court judges to delay. It says upon a finding the defendant committed a registration offense, the court shall enter an order. Uh, so it's not like it says the court may, and if you want to, you can wait until sentencing or you can wait till whenever. Uh, so I, I'm a little unsure about what authority trial judges would have to delay such a finding on your view. Well, and I, in fact, I, you know, there was a footnote in my brief, if I remember right, that um, talked about an example where that would be preferable, it would be advisable to go ahead and order registration at the time of uh, entry of a guilty plea, say if there were a cooperator and everyone agreed uh, to postpone sentencing until the cooperation was complete, but also everyone believed that the, the community should be protected by means of registration. So th that, that's, that's theoretically a, a situation in which there's an incentive to ask that it be applied that way. But I think you're, it, you're saying theoretically this door is open, but I, I guess, you know, my question is along the same lines as Judge McLeese's, which is, is the current practice some evidence of how the statute is reasonably understood, right? So 22-4003A says upon a finding that a defendant committed a registration offense, you go to the definition of committed a registration offense and it says was convicted. And if people think was convicted means not just an adjudication of guilt, but also imposition of a sentence, then trial judges are doing it right right now by not certifying people as sex offenders either for a 10 year period or a lifetime period because until sentencing, mm -hmm. because the person hasn't been it is not a person who was convicted um, until that time. Well, I think the problem is that it is the word convicted is amenable of a few different meanings, and the Supreme Court told us that in deal. Um, and I, I and so that does create um, that question. And when you as a practical matter, it does make sense to do it in conjunction with sentencing as this court's uh, prior cases holding that it was a civil regulatory matter and not a part of the sentencing have have said i think in the end it, the, these statutory interpretation issues and parsing the words is important obviously but in the end it doesn't matter how we define conviction or disposition in this case we all know that they are used differently in different contexts but it doesn't matter here because here as in most cases this offender was in fact sentenced by the time the registration order was issued well, so actually, it doesn't. I, I, if I, I would, recall, if I recall correctly, one sort of odd little twist here is that uh, the trial court uh, resolves the Sora matter before she imposes the sentence. Is that am I wrong about that? I, I, I mean, it's I, moments I'm, before. Well, I'm I talking about if you the, read the 
the transcript, she <laughs> actually decides that he should only register for 10 years. And then she decides what his, um, his criminal sentence should be. But that was, a, that was explaining her reasoning after, after uh, several rounds of briefing and hearings about what she was, where she was coming from. But why does that matter? Way. I mean, if, right, I, and I understand the government thinks was convicted for a deal means something else within the context of the statute. And I'd, I'd still be curious to go through the statute and understand that a little bit better. Um, what what guideposts do you think this, the statute provides us? Um, but but if was convicted means one of its you know commonly understood meanings, which is adjudicated as guilty um, uh, and sentence has been imposed. In this case, her SORA um, registration determination was was premature. At that point, he had not been convicted of the instant crime. Well, it is interesting in, in this case because the trial judge concluded um, throughout that conviction did mean upon a guilty plea. The, this, this trial judge focused very much on disposition and, and I would say came to understand, misunderstand the, um, the, the provisions um, because uh, the, the court became convinced that disposition could only mean a prior final judgment after sentencing, despite the fact that disposition itself as a word is defined in the statute in a manner that makes it clear in my view, in our view that this case counts well, part um, of the problem actually is that disposition isn't really defined in, or it's not defined in the definitional section. Well, right? it's described, disposition's described as it's described in 4,000, which does bring us back to the term committed a registration offense. And Can I, I, I apologize for uh, bouncing back and forth between the details of this case and the statutory interpretation questions, but back just for a second on the details of this case and what happened and what order, yes. if it mattered. And I'm not sure it necessarily does matter exactly when the trial court did some SORA related things and exactly when the trial court imposed sentence. Uh, and one of the interesting features of that, if it does matter, is generally oral imposition of sentence is what's treated as kind of the actual moment of imposition of sentence. Uh, and then there are written orders. There are, there are two written orders. There's a, there's a judgment and commitment order and there's a SORA order. The judgment and commitment order has a time on it. It's, you know, 1657 or some particular <laughs> time on it. The SORA order does doesn't not. have a time on it. So who knows exactly which of those orders, if you really, it mattered minute by minute, happened first and there was oral imposition of the sentence first. Then I got even more confused when I realized that part of the judgment of commitment order is a condition of probation, which is sex offender registration. Uh, so the sentence itself wraps in some SORA related findings and obligations, it seems so. So do you think it's clear, if, if you think it matters which happened first, a finding that the person had committed a, uh, a, a registration offense or completion otherwise of the criminal sentence, do you think we can tell here which happened exactly first, if that matters? Well, you premise this with, do I, if I think it matters, and I don't. And part of that reason is because of the way I think the language of the statute and the legislative history um, supports the notion of it being um, triggered upon, upon a guilty plea, a finding of guilt. Um, and, and the reason is that because if, if you don't consider it that way, the trial court's reasoning here completely undermines the statute and defeats its aims. If conviction Mr. requires Grace, judgment, yes. Let me ask you about that. There are some municipal regulations that speak to these questions. I don't remember them being cited or discussed in any of the briefs, but as I understand one of the regulations, it says that the court shall combine the determination of registration with the sentencing proceeding. And so that seems to undercut your argument that the key moment is the guilty plea. Well, I think that I think the Supreme Court, in its cases in which it looked at um, the Alaska SORA Act, and um, and even well, that that's probably the most relevant one. And then this court's decisions in WM 
um, and subsequent cases uh, highlight that the mere fact that it doesn't, that it's uh, included as part of sentencing, that that's more of a ministerial function that's for the convenience and the, be and the best manner of, of informing the defendant, the offender, of his obligations. Now, getting back, I mean, related to this is that question of the fact that it's um, a condition of uh, release. That does not that does not mean it, it has become part of the sentence. I mean, there are plenty of civil orders or civil matters that are incorporated in as conditions of release in sentencing orders. For example, um, a CPO or a stay away order. There might be an official one from the family court. Um, and the fact that the, that the criminal judge says uh, as a condition, uh, continue to stay away, or even, which sometimes happens prospectively, a judge will say, as a condition of your probation, you are to abide by whatever orders the family court issues, even in the future, uh, with respect to your relationships and so on. If, if you'll excuse me, I think you're mixing up two things in a, in a way that matters, at least to me. Is this part of the sentencing? No. It's in a separate proceeding. When will that separate proceeding occur? And that seems to me to at least uh, be susceptible to interpretation that it is not a part of the sentence, but it shall not occur until the sentence proceeding, sentencing proceeding occurs. Well, I, th I, I think that the, the um, I'm not sure, again, as, as the way that the words of the statute read, that it, that it does have to await sentencing. But I do think that um, given that it can occur in conjunction with sentencing um, and that that doesn't change its character and its independent nature um, and its civil nature and all that, they're related. Um, I, I understand that the, the question of the timing, um, you know, in, in the trial court, that was, um, I guess if you want to look at it as kind of our fallback argument, that we really did believe that this became effective at the time of uh, the obligation existed, even if it wasn't imposed, the obligation to register existed at the time um, of a finding of guilt. And the reason is, and, and that makes sense in the context of this statute, because it, the statute is clearly intending to um, have a first offender appear on the sex offender registration um, list. And if it were not, if, if the understanding was that the conviction had to be final and it could not be done immediately in the, at the same time to, to require registration, then there would be an automatic first free pass for every sex offender. And then second, or and as a the trial judge thought here, erroneously in, in our view, um, it would take the third um, assault on a young vulnerable victim in order to uh, qualify for lifetime registration, hey, which just I'm sorry, can square. you walk me through that argument? Okay, so if we're looking, you're saying for a first time offender, you're looking at the language of 22-4002A? No. Um, right, the registration, right? You're yes. saying for a first time offender, which I think Judge McLeese asked you about, the registration for period shall start when a disposition described in 22-4001-3A occurs. Okay, so if the disposition is described is committed a registration offense, which means 3A sub I was convicted. So, or found NGI. Or found the NGI, NGI, right? But if we're just focusing on someone who's been convicted of a qualifying sex offense, if they've been adjudicated guilty, and a sentence has been imposed, then 
why can't they be put on the registry for 10 years at that juncture? I'm, I'm just not, you're making some sort of, you know, well, the, that the, would be absurd argument. And, well, the, and it seems like you get what you want under that reading. Well, the suggestion that, that you can't have committed, or you can't have been a, have a conviction until the end of sentencing would suggest that therefore then this conviction doesn't count. I mean, if that, if that, if that conceptually is true, that there, that the, the conviction cannot count until after there's been a sentence, then, then um, I, I do think that registration, we do think registration- After there's that. been a sentence or after the, a sentence has been served? Well, right? the, I mean, I, I guess, are, are you giving up too much? It, it just seems like no, what I'm suggesting sentence is could be imposed and then this person could be, you know, in the category of someone who was convicted. Right. I mean, no, af I'm after I have been sentenced of a crime, you know, I a jury has found me guilty. A judge has imposed a sentence. I am now a person who was convicted of that crime. Right. Or or do you think something else has to happen? Well, I think that. It's not irrelevant that the definition of committed a registration offense includes things other than was convicted, that it includes NGI and it includes um, having been declared a sexual psychopath. Neither of those things involve a sentencing. We're imputing into- Right, I mean, sexual psychopaths, right? That, that's sort of tricky to look at that right now, right? Because yes, we don't have that system in place. But I take it your argument as far as NGI is that really what's going on there is the person has been found legally guilty and yet we are not holding them responsible as a legal matter because of mental health issues. And so therefore we should look at was convicted as also a reference to legal guilt. Is that what, you're, is that what the government is saying? Because they're, yes, they're together, a, right? Yes, I mean, they're, it's a, three A sub I. It's either was convicted or found guilty, uh, found not guilty by reason of insanity, which is not a true not guilty. It, if you were really not guilty, you would be acquitted, right? But if you're guilty, but there are these extenuating circumstances, you might be not guilty by reason of insanity. So that there's parity between the was convicted and the not guilty by reason of insanity. There's that they're par yes, in the sense that they're parallel um, ways to, to get there. And then you add to that the legislative history. Can I ask you, I just wanna make sure I, I'm a little confused structurally. So let's see if uh, you can help me with this. At times today, it seems like you think we have only two choices. One is agree with what I thought was your broader position, which is the obligation to register as a sex offender and the judge's obligation to impose a sex offender registration order occur, both of them are triggered at the time of the adjudication of guilt. That's one theory. It seems like at times today, you have been suggesting that if we don't agree with that theory, then the absurdities that you're pointing out about first time offenders and you have to get three in order to qualify for a lifetime offender follow inevitably. So we have that binary choice. I had thought from your brief that you had a fallback argument that was in between those. That was even if the uh, obligation to register as a sex offender and even if the obligation to register as a sex offender don't occur until a conviction has been imposed in the strong sense of uh, adjudication of guilt and imposition of sentence. That nonetheless, that can happen the judge can finish all that, not only can, but must finish all that, and then make the sex offender determination. So that in a first time offense, the judge would say, uh, you know, at the time of the adjudication of guilt, the judge would say, well, not sex offender registration time yet. But then at the time of sentencing, the judge would impose sentence on the criminal case, and then would say, okay, now it's time to think about sex offender registration. I have someone who is, you know, has been convicted of a sex offender registration because I've already imposed sentence. Now I'm gonna impose a registration order and the person now is required to register. Um, and the same then would work in a case like this where after imposing sentence in this case on the criminal component of sentencing, the judge would look to the defendant then, not earlier, and say, okay, now what is the right kind of length, you know, duration of registration requirement 
now that this person has been convicted of, in the full sense of having sentence imposed on, you know, two while vying uh, uh, offenses, the person is a lifetime of offender. Uh, do you think we have only two question uh, options? Well, or those three. Well, I guess I, I guess I, I, your honor stated my argument exactly right. There is that that in between. I think I think this the legislative history and the parsing of the stat language of the statute itself can support the notion that um, conviction occurs at the time of. Uh, uh, of enter of, of finding a guilt, and that that solves the problem that the that appellee has raised. Alternatively, that um, it, it, if the problem appellee has flagged um, can be, can be solved in the manner that the court just described and that I described in my brief, and that is that you know the the the, the uh, criminal adjudication is made, the sentencing is made, and then the registration um, order is, is uh, imposed. And I think that's, that's in fact what we were talking about earlier, what actually happens most of the time. The problem is, or the issue is, and this addresses Judge Easterly's point, I think about, do I give something up too, too soon on the, on the, the, the don't, don't I get, don't we get what we want for a first time offender? And that is, if you apply that logic in the first time offender situation, it has to apply in the second offender situation, there can't be it, 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 if you if 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 someone can be forced to register be, because of an offense before the trial court right now, and the minute they're sentenced, they then get they then are forced to register are ordered to register. The exact same procedure, the exact same reasoning happens on their second offense, and it's it was improper for this trial judge to look at that and say I can't count the second one because it isn't finished. It's the exact same analysis. That's the point I was trying to make. I, I think what hung the, the trial judge up was the difference in the language though, right? And I Between, think I have an expert. I, and I would love to hear it, right? But just to make sure that we're on the same page, yeah. right? Because, um, you know, under 22, 4002B1, you know, it's sort of parallel, well, it's not parallel. It, it suggests the same analysis of the first time offender if the person has committed a qualifying lifetime registration offense, right? It's you've committed a registration offense that is a lifetime registration offense, mm -hmm. right? But but three and four have this different language of has been subject on two or more occasions too. When <laughs> it just seems like the legislature could have said committed a registration offense on two or more occasions, right? Like there was just well, a great I, way to go to get to where um, to where the government wants us to go. And for whatever reason, you know, the, the council decided that it wanted to use different language and we're, we're stuck wondering why. Well, I think I have an explanation. Um, at the court, the trial court was hung up on the fact that the word disposition was used in the latter categories, the ones that apply here, and wasn't, whereas committed was used in the first instance. And I think the difference is that in 4001-3A, that by definition refers to only one offense, a lifetime registration eligible offense. So he committed that offense. Um, as we try to explain, but I think um, could do, you know, could have possibly done a better job in front of the trial judge, in our view, disposition is used in the statute as kind of a shorthand in order to encompass all of the ways in which possible types of dispositions that could count. The trial court felt that um, ha had one concept of the definition of disposition, that it required a judgment, a sentence and a judgment on that sentence. Um, but, but there is, the court shouldn't have been thinking along those lines because disposition is amenable to is subject to many different meetings. But in this case, there are, there are many ways in which there can be a disposition. There could be a commission of one registration offense long, 10 years ago and another second one right now. There could be a commission of two registration offenses against two different victims in the past. There can be commission of two offenses against those victims now. Can I, can I cut you off and say, I mean, yeah. I, I actually, I think I I see dis my hang up is not with disposition okay. actually right and, and 
So a disposition described in 22-4001-3A, right? And 4001-3A doesn't define disposition, but 4001-3A says committed a registration offense. So the, the catchphrase disposition described in 22-4001-3A seems to me a synonym for committed a registration offense, right? I, I, because I, they both in then reference that all of the subparts of 4001-3A, right? So there, what I'm hung up on is the verbs. The 4002-B1 talks about committed a registration offense and 4002-B3 and 4 talk about has been subject on two or more occasions to, and it's the has been subject that is tripping me up a little bit. And again, I'm just wondering why didn't the council just say committed a registration offense or on two or more occasions and use the defined terminology of the statute, right? Yeah. And, and I, I don't have, I mean, I don't have an insight or an answer into that, that precise question why they use those precise words. However, I do think your honor kind of answered the question in the lead up to it by saying that they're effectively equivalent because, because um, B3 and B4 incorporate the definition of um, 3A, committed a registration offense. They both one, three, one, three and four all effectively use the term committed a registration offense. They are the same. And I, 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 think it's, I think it was just a way to say, I mean, my best explanation is that it was a way to say there are many ways, there are many possible dispositions. There are many possible ways in which someone could have more than one prior offense. But it doesn't change the fact that, that, the, that, you, the, that I agree with the court that they, it refers back to committed. And in that sense, the, the definitions are the same. So if, if committed causes a problem because of someone's view of when a conviction occurs, then it, it's the same whether it, it's a single offense or multiple offenses. Because, because B3 and B4 incorporate by reference 4001-3A, and that which says committed a registration offense, there is no effective difference. Okay. I, we, might, we might have wished for greater clarity in chosen different words had we written it. But I think when you combine, um, uh, understand that it, it, it uh, harkens back to the same definition, and you understand the legislative history and the purpose of the, um, the act. Uh, and, and third, understand that if it's interpreted the way this trial court interpreted it, the, the purpose aim and aim of the statute would be undermined. Um, and it would also lead to anomalous results that we talked about in our brief uh, about how out of jurisdiction folks might be treated differently than DC folks. And I think it's also as a final uh, thought, worth remembering you know, that SORA was part of a nationwide push to prevent sex offender recidivism. Um, so the notion that DC law would somehow be devised to ensure that DC offenders got one free pass or that, D that two didn't mean two, two means three, just doesn't make any sense in the context of the statute as a whole. Ms. Um, Sprague, let me take you back to I think I'll uh, paraphrase words I think you used in your first sentence about a half hour ago. Yeah. Oh, I've gone way over, sorry. Clear and indisputable. Really? <laughs> I think it's clear and indisputable that the intent of the law was to uh, prevent recidivism and to warn the community, to protect the community against recidivists. This defendant, this appellee was clearly a recidivist. I don't think anyone on this Zoom call or in that courtroom thought he wasn't a recidivist. And yet the court found a way um, uh, to, to not treat him as a recidivist. So in that respect, I think, and not only that, the court itself, the, the, the court's, trial court's own words betrayed 
uh, her misunderstanding of it. Rather than understanding, I, I understand this isn't troubling the court now, but rather than understanding that SORA certification was a civil and non-punitive matter, um, the judge said, well, actually, I don't see those as separate. But more importantly, the judge specifically concluded that the, quote, intent of SORA was to, quote, trigger a lifetime registration on the third and not the second conviction, which I would submit is, is it's clear and indisputable that that was not the intent of the language um, used by the council and not the intent of the council in passing the Registration Act. So for that reason, I would urge this court to um, order the trial court to reconsider its certification order of the sex offender, sex offender status and order that he be certified for life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frake. I, I will take full responsibility for letting you um, talk <laughs> Thank for you. over a half an hour. I, I wanted to hear what you had to say. So, Thank you. <laughs> um, so now we will turn to uh, Mr. Hawkins' counsel. When you're ready. Thank you. Um, can your honors hear me? Yes. Lee Gabus on behalf of Appali Delanta Hawkins. Um, I'd like to address turning to, to what your honors were concerned at the very beginning, I guess throughout, what does um, conviction mean in this statute? And I think that when you look at the statute as a whole, the way that it works, it clear, clearly means the final determination of a case, including the sentencing. And how do we know that? I think the best way to think about, one way to think about it is to consider a defendant who is released pretrial, because under the government's theory, such a defendant would be obligated at that point um, to re comply entirely with, with the SORA. Um, if you look out at, however, at 224015, it says compliance with the requirements of this chapter shall be mandatory condition of probation, parole, supervised release and conditional release of sex offenders. Nothing about pretrial releasees. It uh, often, but I want to make sure I follow that point. So someone, a first offender at least, so someone who's charged with a registration offense but hasn't yet been adjudicated, why would that provision uh, require registration on the government's view? That person wouldn't be a sex offender yet. No, and the person, the under the government's view, the person who has been either found guilty by a verdict or by a plea under the government's view would be required uh, to follow the strictures of SORA. Oh. For sure, for, for sure, the government has made very explicit its view is that the registration requirement and the order, the requirement to issue an order is triggered at the time of the adjudication of guilt. So, yes, if that's your point, that's true. That's the United States' position. That's its broadest position. Right. I think something more than that about people who are on pretrial release. People who are on pretrial release who have been adjudicated, who have been either found guilty by a verdict or... By a plea. I don't understand the word pretrial if they have been adjudicated. I'm sorry, I should say pre sentencing. Okay, I'm sorry. That's, that's where I got, pre sentencing. Yeah, that's where I got confused. Thank you. Um, let me, let me ask you to clarify your point about condition of probation. Why can't you have both, sort of a belt and suspenders uh, approach? The registration order is a legal order, and there are sanctions for failing to comply with that. But we will also make compliance a condition of probation. Is there anything contradictory about those two things? I'm I'm not sure I follow your honor's question. I was I was um, I mean my my point is that throughout it's it's clear that the SORA requirements don't kick in until there's a final adjudication, including the sentence. And one of the ways we know that is one of the ways we know is 4015. I mean, another way we know that is- Just to put out, why do you think the government, so, so I, I think we've clarified that you're, you're saying that the logical implication of the government's broadest view is that SORA registration requirements and SORA order issuance requirements are triggered at the time of an adjudication of guilt. You seem to say, oh, so you're pointing out that consequence and you're saying, well, we know that must be wrong, but I haven't quite heard yet why you think it must be wrong. Why does that have to be wrong? Uh, why couldn't that be the right answer? The United States says that's what the legislative history tends to support. And so wh why do we think that's, why do you think that's just obviously got to be an incorrect broadest view? 
Well, I can tell you that in Superior Court, that is absolutely not the practice. But more importantly, I think that's because of the statute. I mean, looking also at 4003 certification duties, the court, what, once it finds, once it certifies someone as a sex offender, they have to provide CSOSA with all the paperwork, not pretrial services. Again, if the government's theory is right, that at the time of a guilty, in this case, a guilty plea, um, SORA kicks in, would also provide um, that it would have to provide pretrial services, right? Um, with all of those. Counsel, what about 22-4003D that says the applicability of the requirements of this chapter to a person otherwise subject to this chapter doesn't depend on the courts making a certification under subsection A of this section? I mean, I, I get that they're, you know, obviously they're due process requirements, right? Somebody has to be on notice at some point, somehow that they're supposed to register. But D seems to indicate that it doesn't necessarily have to be from the court, right? And 22-4007 really seems to put the primary responsibility regarding SORA registration and monitoring on CISOSA. So I'm sort of wondering, again, this kind of gets back to why, you know, why does this have to, why, why couldn't a guilty plea and adjudication of guilt um, be the, the triggering event um, that creates the obligation um, maybe the obligation is unenforceable unless and until somebody has been notified of it for due process purposes. But um, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of sort through the, you know, there are a lot of odd provisions in the statute. Right. Um, but I guess my immediate question is what do you make of subsection D of 22-4003? Right, this is when a, a court is, I mean, because in this case, the court would be required to enter an order certifying that person um, when they're found in a proceeding before the court to have committed a registration offense, which is what we have here. So I think it just takes us- I guess, back to right, the but plate. my question is, does the first sentence, is the first sentence um, uh, inapplicable when, a court is required to order, uh, enter an order of certification, right? Like, cause you could read D to say, hey, regardless of what the court does, um, you know, a person is still, the, these, these requirements still apply, but there are certain instances where a court is obligated to act. Or do you think that's a misreading of this provision? I think that is a misreading in the context, yes, in the context of this case, again, where everything is in, in a circumstance like um, presented here, um, all of those obligations don't kick in until, I mean, it just gets us back to the primary question of what a conviction is um, under this statute, which I think clearly means a, a complete resolvement of the case, including, including sentencing. I, another Another clue, I think, to that is looking at the registration period 4002A. Again, it says that the 10-year period starts at the point the offender is placed on probation, parole, supervised release, etc. So under the government's theory, when someone entered a plea of guilty to a sex offense, they would be required to comply with SORA, but the actual period of uh, 10 years wouldn't kick in until they're actually put on probation. I think that's rather nonsensical and again shows that when the court used the word conviction, it meant what conviction often means in the law, a final, um, the final disposition of the case, including, including the sentence. Rather Counsel, let's assume that we were to agree with you that conviction means uh, imposition of sentence on judgment under this provision although it doesn't always mean that, but let's say we agreed with you that was the better reading of these provisions taken as a whole. Uh, the, the United States argues in the alternative 
uh, that you still can't prevail because the way to understand these provisions, even if that part is right, is that the judge in, let's say, a first offender case would uh, there be an adjudication of guilt. The judge would then impose criminal sentence and then the judge would say, OK, now what do I do about sex offender registration? And then would make a determination in a, in a first offender case. Well, I now have someone who has committed a registration offense. Uh, and I want to, so I want to, and I didn't really see a response to this in your brief, so I want to make sure I understand your position. How do you, on your view, is that correct about a first offender registration so that the judge can and must in a first offender case, uh, after the adjudication of guilt and after imposing sentence, you know, pure, pure criminal sentence, what is the degree of purely criminal punishment, uh, then can and must say, okay, but now I have someone who has committed a first offense and therefore now I must require registration. Is that uh, how it should be and must be interpreted? Or do you think actually the government is right that your view means that you know first offenders get a sort of a, a one-time freebie uh, and can't be required to register as to their first offense? Um, so I think there's two things going on there. I think the this boogeyman of even a first offender wouldn't have to register um, is not borne out by the tenses used. Again, if you look in the registration period, it says committed a registration offense as opposed to has been subject to on two or more occasions, that language. So the city council must have meant something by has been. And I think that it means something that has happened um, in the past as opposed to what's happening now. I mean, I think you're- so You said there were two things. So that. Uh, um... And I, I hope that one of those two things is what your position is about the correct interpretation of a first offender case. Is it your position that in a first offender case, the trial court is required to first impose sentence and the criminal sentence otherwise, and then turn to sex offender registration and then must, if it's a sex offender offense, impose sex offender registration. So I, I just wanna make sure I know what your position is on that. We believe that if the, a defendant is being sentenced for a lifetime offense, um, my, and there okay. are- any I just want to make sure we're talking about a first time life offender. For a life first offense. offender, yeah, we do agree that that person would have to register, but we do not agree that it's some sort of separate proceeding um, where your honor posits first we do the sentencing and then somehow we do um, the SOAR registration afterwards. It, it's clearly all part of the same proceeding. And How do those two things fit together because, with your emphasis on the past tense? Uh, and so in a first offender lifetime registration offense, if someone has been adjudicated guilty and is about to have a sentencing proceeding relating to a lifetime offense, right. and the judge says, okay, I, am, I have two things to do today. You're saying they're inseparable, I think. The two things I have to do today are impose you know, the criminal sentence, but as part of that, I need to determine sex offender registration. And you're saying, don't pull those two things apart. They're intrinsically intertwined. But if you can't really, if I'm understanding your point, then I don't quite see how your answer to the first offender registration is what it is because the judge hasn't finished imposing criminal conviction in the full sense at the time the judge, because that sentencing is still going on in your view. It's not over. It's, it's you know part of the same inseparable, indivisible event. Right. Uh, if it's all right, then I don't see how the judge can, in your view, impose sex offender registration on a first time life offender uh, offender. So what am I, what am I missing? I think because the language of the statute 4002A is in present tense and- Which 4, part of the language are you looking at? Sorry, Your Honor. Well, no, I mean- it, right, so, I mean, 4002A, two, if we're looking, sorry, if we're looking at A or B, I mean, I'm focused on B, B, you know, they both, A and B both talk about the registration period shall start when a disposition described in 4001-3A occurs, right? That's so present, that's present. present yeah. But then, you know, for B it says, and this is going to be a lifetime registration offense for someone who, under sub one, committed a registration offense. Committed, I mean, not to get 
too I, steeped in, in grammar and verb tenses, but committed is simple past, right? And I think- So that, that happened. And if you look at committed a registration offense, you get to 4,013A, which defines committed a registration offense as um, in, to include was convicted, right? Also in, in the, the past. 4,002, 3, B, I mean, 4,002, B, 3, um, says has been subjected on two or more occasions. And has been subjected is, I think that's um, present perfect. Past present perfect. <laughs> right? Past Which is perfect. talking about, you know, something in the indefinite past and possibly continuing into the present. And referring to this disposition that's described in 4,013A, which is the includes the was convicted. I, I guess I don't understand why it doesn't get you to the same place, even though they used a whole lot of extra words that I'm not under quite sure that I understand why they used. Um, it it doesn't seem to to point us in a different direction, clearly. Well, I, I mean, I think with B1 committed a registration offense, it's a lifetime registration offense. The council is referring to the case then at bar, as opposed to the past tense overlay in three and four has been subject to. That language has to mean it seems something. to be backwards. I mean, B starts with present tense. You know, it's, it has occurs. You know, the registration period shall start when the disposition described occurs. So all of those have a present tense intro. And then B1, which I think you're acknowledging, uh, allows for uh, SORA registration occurring contemporaneous with the criminal, you know, imposition of full judgment on sentence is, pa is purely it, it, the, the, the first word of B1 is pa completely past. I mean, it's just past tense couldn't be more past tense. Three and four are, they're, they're not even, I think, has been subjected. There has been subject. I'm not quite sure what that is, uh, but it's some kind of, you know, present perfect something or other, or present imperfect something or other. Uh, uh, so if, if you're like really hung up on tenses, it seems like B1 has a more past tense feel to it than B3 and B4. I, I, I mean, I think I just disagree. Um grammatically or the way we understand language, I think has been subject on two or more occasions, clearly refers to something in the past. Um, well, so does commit, I mean, so does committed. But I think committed refer, it, in context refers to the offense at, at bar, the offense at hand. Um, Council, let me ask you about someone who is found guilty in a state, state of Minnesota, and comes to DC and is told he's required to register. You have to agree, I hope, that what's going on in DC is a proceeding separate from the criminal sentencing. Uh, I would, I'm. Yes. So why is it impossible, which I understand to be your view, that in this particular case, there were two separate proceedings occurring at the same time and place, a criminal sentencing and then a determination of whether the fellow who had just been sentenced would have to register for life or only for 10 years. Again, we don't see them. I, I think this out of state anomaly um, really isn't an anomaly. And I think you could treat the person from Minnesota the same as a person from DC because it talks about starts when a disposition occurs, right? And that disposition could be the disposition in Minnesota. And then you put yourself in the position of, of that disposition. And at the point that they were being adjudicated in Minnesota, ha had they been subject to um, 
two or more on two or more occasions before that um, to 10 year registration, uh, misdemeanor registration offenses in our case. So you would just put your in a judge in DC deciding whether um, he or she needed to certify someone for life would measure that from the point of the out of state hearing. So you would not look at it in real time, what's, what's going on in DC? You would say we have to roll the clock back and the DC judge addresses what was the situation at the time of sentencing in Minnesota? Correct. Can I ask you, okay. you seem to be making two slightly different points. I wanna just make sure I understand each of them. One of them is about uh, differences in terminology between, for example, B1 committed a registration offense and B3 and B4 has been subject on two or more occasions to a disposition or has been subject to two or more dispositions. So I get the idea that possibly you can interpret those language, you know, that language differently and you could interpret one to permit consideration. At, although there's past tense in one, you could consider the adjudication and sentence that has just been imposed for B1, but not for B3 and B4 because the language is different. So that's at least possible. So I get that line of thought. There is a separate point you seem to be making, which is leaving that aside, it's just not right to think of the criminal sentencing and the SORA registration as distinct. They are, you can't dissect them. You can't make one of them first and then treat the other one second. And I, I have, I guess, two questions about that second point. One of them is, or one of them is an observation, which I've sort of hinted at already, which is if that second point is right, then I don't quite understand why you concede B1, because if you can't pull them apart, then you can't get to any past tense in B1 either. But so I still am puzzled by that. But my other question is, what is it in the statute or really in anything else in law anywhere? What is your kind of doctrinal support for the idea that it's just wrong to look at the criminal sentencing otherwise as something that can be separate enough from and completed before uh, SORA registration? What is it that tells you those are inextricably entangled? I mean, statutorily, again, if you look at 224015B, it says compliance with the requirements of this chapter shall be mandatory condition of probation, parole, supervised release, and conditional release. So a judge has to include in its probation or supervised release order compliance with with SORA and as happened in this case if you look at her um, special conditions of probation she required him to register as a class b sex offender um, so both under the statute and then practically um, you can't you can't tease that out the judge wouldn't know you know could, couldn't order someone to be a class B or a class A sex offender um, it, without uh, simultaneously resolving uh, which class of offender the, the defendant before him or I her. I wonder if it's necessary to do those simultaneously as opposed to sequentially. That is, why couldn't a judge say, okay, you're going to jail for this long and I'm gonna suspend part of it and you're on probation. Part of the conditions of probation will be that you comply, comply with any sex offender requirements that I impose upon you. Stay tuned, cause we're now about to turn to the question of sex offender registration. Court determines that. And then it says, we got one thing to tidy up now. Now that I've told you, you have to register as a class A offender for the rest of your life. That requirement is a condition of the probation that I imposed earlier today. What, what's wrong with that? I mean, it seems highly artificial and, and technical. And again, if, if you're saying to the defendant- How about practical? I mean, it doesn't seem, again, under you're on, your honor saying what I just said relates back to what I did a few minutes earlier with respect to putting you on, on, on probation. 
Um, I mean, it's not. I get your point, Can I, but I, I keep running up against the following problem. The logical consequence of it seems to be that no sex offender registration should be imposed in a first conviction. Because if I understand your point, the point you're making now, the judge is supposed to do things in the following order. Uh, okay. I am about to impose sentence, and let's say the judge in, 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 intends to impose a period of probation or a period of supervised release. So I'm gonna have a sex offender registration issue to determine before I can impose the actual criminal sentence, which will require a term of super, you know, uh, compliance with sex offender registration for purposes of supervised release or conditions of probation. Well, so I, but, but, um, so I have to do sex offender registration first. Well, there's no conviction yet because I haven't imposed sentence. So the defendant hasn't committed a registration offense, so I can't uh, impose sex offender registration. It, it seems like the point you're making, which I, I get technically, seems to have, keep having this consequence that is broader than what you are acknowledging, and that's where I'm, I'm struggling to reconcile the two. I mean, again, I'm just have to go back to the language of the statute and the juxtaposition of has been subject to. No, no, I, but, but here, sir, let me make sure, to tell me your analysis of the following. I'm a, sentence, I'm a sentencing judge. The defendant has pled guilty to, let's say, a 10-year sex offender registration offense, and I'm about to impose sentence. And so I say, okay, it's time for me to impose sentence. Uh, I am trying to write my, I'm, I'm first orally announcing the sentence I'm going to impose, which is how it would happen ordinarily first. And I need to say, um, you know, well, I'm going to get to a point in imposing this sentence where I need to say, you need to comply with 10 years, you know, I'm making a condition of probation that you comply with my sex offender order. Well, your point, I think, is the judge can't do that yet. The judge would need to say, oh, no, no, hold on. I, I, and that, so, oops, I can't finish sentence. I can't create a conviction in the strong sense of the term yet. I have to do sex offender registration first because I have to know what that is before I can put it in an essential component of creating the first conviction. I don't have a conviction yet. Um, there isn't one yet. So, oops, I have to do sex offender registration first. And there is no, since there's no conviction, I can't do any. What, 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 tell me how you think a judge can get out of that box. What, what, what that's supposed to say, no, 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 that's not the problem. Here's how it's supposed to work under the statute. I can go ahead and impose sentence otherwise, create a conviction that has a sentence, and then do sex offender registration for a first offense because that's where I, that's where you lose me about how your analysis allows the judge to work through the problems you've identified. I mean, I hate to keep going back to it, but it's just the different language that's used. But I'm not, I, it doesn't help me much uh, to, to focus on three or four and has been subject. I get the idea those could mean different things. But, but if I'm just asking you on your analysis about how inseparable these are and what the or logical order between them must be, how is a judge supposed to proceed in imposing uh, sentence and sex offender registration in a first offense? Can you just tell me, you know, the judge will first do what? And here's why that fits under the language of B1. Just walk me through how will the order in which you think the judge can and should do it and how it fits under the statutory terms for the judge to impose sex offender registration for a first conviction. I mean, Cause I think again, under 4002A and then 4003A, upon a finding that the defendant committed a registration offense, they shall enter an order certifying. I mean, it's all, wrapped up into one thing. So it's, again, I think, I, I guess I'm struggling to, 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 to follow exactly your, your question. Um, Can I ask a different question? Um, one of the things that strikes me if um, your argument is correct is that the statute is silent as far as how you're supposed to deal with um, the person who's been subject to a first time registration offense that gets 10 years and a second time registration offense that gets 10 years under your 
theory, right? You'd, you'd think that the, if that's how it works, that you get sort of two opportunities before the third time when you get lifetime registration, that you would have some provision that explains, oh, well, if you commit a second registration offense while you're on a 10-year um, registration term, we will, you know, stagger and just, ex you know, it'll start at the time of, of sentencing and just extend a little bit beyond or the two 10 year periods run consecutive to each other, but there's nothing in there, right? The statute just says there's a 10 year registration term and then there's a lifetime registration term. And that seems like a conspicuous omission um, if, if your argument is correct. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, Your Honor, whether um, someone with two 10-year um, offenses would what would ser serve or be subject to those 10 years concurrently or, or consecutively. I don't see anything in the statute to, to answer that. Um, and it hasn't become ripe in my client's case, so I haven't thought it through. Um, but I don't, I don't see anywhere in the statute that answers the question of whether it could be consecutive or concurrent. And the court obviously doesn't need to resolve that um, for its decision in this case. That's a, a question for another day if and when it arises, whether it's concurrent or consecutive. Okay. Um, uh, just, uh, Judge, Judge McLeese, I was, did you have another question? I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead, counsel. If you want to, if you want to wrap up, we've kept you up there uh, for a while. Right. I mean, I think that, I think Judge Fisher alluded to this too. I mean, we think that you're on mandamus review and this has to be clear and indisputable. And I think from the conversations that are going on today, we, th we, we think our reading is right. But at the very least, the correct um, reading here is not clear and indisputable. So on a mandamus review, which we think is the only conceivably uh, basis for this court's jurisdiction, uh, you, you would have to deny mandamus, um, given that clear and indisputable standard. All right. Thank you, counsel. Uh, we'll hear again from the government for just a few minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, yeah, just a couple quick points. Um, one, to start kind of where you left off. Um, the reason I would submit that the statute doesn't address two 10-year offenses, 10-year registration requirements, is because that's not what's intended. And that's not how the statute was written. The second offense is a lifetime registration requirement. And the fact that there's no such thing as two 10 years run consecutive um, there is no second 10-year uh, registration offense. There's a 10-year. Is that, is that right? What about someone who is convicted at a single trial of two sex offender registration offenses that involves the same victim? Wouldn't you then be imposing uh, multiple sex offender registration uh, requirements, one in each count? And I know that you wouldn't get life but I, no. I was just thinking, are there scenarios where you could in a sense? Well, the way, I, the way I read the statute, no, you would not. That person would only be entitled, we'd only be entitled to one 10-year uh, registration because if you look at uh, sub, sub three and sub four, one of them refers to uh, two separate victims in the same... Um, well, I, I know they wouldn't be subject to life. Uh, if, it, if it's two separate victims, I'm sorry, I'm showing you my outline, a lot of good that does. If, there, if there's two separate, if there's two separate offenses against two separate victims, then they, then they qualify under. No, I, I, I get all that. I get okay. all that. So the scenario I'm asking you about is uh, there are a single, you know, a single indictment charges uh, multiple offenses against a single victim and goes to trial and then the judge is imposing sentence on let's say two counts, each of which is a 10 year sex offender registration count. So now the judge at a single sentencing, single victim, uh, it ha but, but has to impose, you know, it, 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 is it that it doesn't go count by count and it's independent no. of the, and it's driven, no. by, driven by case. And although it might be a condition of probation or release in each of the counts, 
the sex offender registration, it doesn't really go offense by offense. Is that your point? Yes, I, th I think that's right. And I have a, I have a footnote in my brief talking about um, one of those sections applies it to the to the situation you're talking about, and one and the other one apply one one of those sections applies to two different victims. It could be in the same case or a different case, and the other section applies to two different occasions. No, I got that, and I'm giving so, you a third. And I don't think there's a third thing that allows no, there is a, us. There's definitely a third thing. It's just that I'm pretty sure, which is the example I gave you. So the two the, the two ways you can get to life offenses out of 10 year, you know, what otherwise would be 10 year offenses, like, you know, life registration, recidivist life registration is if you have, you know, two different date, their whole, you know, two different dates of conviction, whatever you think conviction means, that's one way. And other is even if it's on the same date of conviction, if there are two different victims involved. Exactly. But the other possibility is that you're getting multiple convictions on the same day relating to a single victim. And, and I think that's not, that's not a possibility. I, my, my reading of the statute is that that's not contemplated as having separate registration requirements. That's, so that, that's my reading. Right, I, right. I, you know, I think, um, but it was uh, to me very, so anyway, my point is that the reason you don't see the, the anything addressing those multiple um, tenure uh, registration orders is because they can't occur. When it's the second one, it becomes life. I thought the uh, Judge Easterly's focus uh, focusing us on 22-4003-D is very helpful because it reminds us that you can be, there are two ways that you can be ordered to register. One is generally applies when you uh, don't have a case right before the court. You have convictions in another jurisdiction or you have a federal, federal case and you've now been released from prison. You're now subject to registration. See, SOSA decides that. There's a provision in the statute to allow the offender to challenge that CSOSA's decision about 10 years versus lifetime if, if uh, he or she thinks that's appropriate. So, and I think when you're talking about um, uh, in, in 22-4003, the second, there, there is either, um, there's either that way that CSOSA does it for a case that's not before the court, or there's what's referred to in subsection D. The court is required to enter an order certifying that a person is a sex offender only when, one, the defendant is found in a proceeding before the court to have committed a registration offense. To me, that, to us, that clearly indicates that the, uh, the, the case at bar is the case that triggers the registration. And that to me is quite clear from uh, subsection D1 of 22403. Um, finally, can I, can I ask a question that takes us a little bit off topic, but is sort of related to the jurisdictional question? Um, you know, assuming that this falls under uh, 11721 and is a, you know, a civil appeal in nature, I found myself kind of wondering why the government is before us, the United States government, as opposed to, um, you know, CISOSA perhaps. I mean, and not to be flipped, but kind of what's, what's it to the government? This isn't part of the criminal case, right? As, as the government views it. Um, and, um, and nothing in the statute talks about the government filing anything. Um, and so I just was curious what the government's view of, of this is? It's an excellent question. I think, I, I know, seriously, I think it's very, uh, I mean, in, in the other, the other SORA cases that have been, been before this court have been in Ray WM, in Ray, you know, they, they, they've been more civil st styled a civil case. Um, so I, I understand that question. I think it's, I think it's that it's, uh, as both this court and the Supreme Court have said, there's a efficiency to handling this altogether. And we, uh, as the government, have an interest in ensuring that, uh, that, that the proper things are done at the end of a conviction um, and that, and that uh, the community is protected in that way. So I, I don't, you know, that I don't are you, I mean, to, to be blunt, are you overstepping your bounds, right? You know, is this, is if it, we, is it your place to, to be here? 
Um, if we were not here, there would be no remedy. I think that's one concern. There's no, who, who else would apply, you know, be able to correct this. CSOS is not involved at this point because this is an outgrowth of a conviction of a case that we prosecuted. So I think that's the reason why we're here. That's my, that's my best understanding. I mean, CISOS is not involved at this point when you have a case that's the case at bar that triggers the, uh, the registration. But that's why 4003D directs the court in this case, obligates the court, it's mandatory, it is not discretionary to enter these orders at this point. Um, I guess finally, my last point is I just, to the extent the terms are, are seen as ambiguous, I think it's important to remember that, um, uh, and, and I think there's not been a, a real challenge or concern about this being a civil regulatory matter separate from sentencing. Um, you know, the, the, any ambiguity should be liberally construed for the benefit of the class that the law was intended to protect. And here, of course, that's uh, the public. It's particularly vulnerable minor um, uh, victims of these offenders. And there is just, it, 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 it is not applying that, that lens. It's important that um, the recidivists here be treated the way that the council intended um, and that the, that, that the protection of the community in, by means of lifetime registration not be made to await a third uh, assault on a vulnerable victim. For that reason, we would urge the court to uh, order the trial court to reconsider its certification of appellee's sex offender status and order uh, registration for life. Thank you, Ms. Sprague. Um, thanks to all counsel and the case will be submitted and the court stands adjourned. This court